Good afternoon, everyone. Um, these are all very welcome to um, our planning committee, and mostly planning committee. I'm going to hand over to Maura and ask her to take us through the roll, roll call. Maura, are you there? Yes, Chair, thanks. Members, you're hereby summoned to attend the monthly meeting of the planning committee held remotely on Wednesday, the 5th of May, 2021. Councillor Jason Barr. Here, Maura. Thanks, Jason. Councillor John Boyle. Here. Thanks, John. Alderman Alan Breslin. Alderman Breslin will be here, but it could be three o'clock before he, he gets on. Okay, thanks. Um, Councillor Angela Dobbins, Centre Apologies. Councillor Paul Gallagher. And Shaw. Sure. Thanks, Paul. Councillor Sean Harkin. Councillor Sean Harkin. I'll come back. Councillor Christopher Jackson. And Shaw. Sure. Councillor Dan Kelly. And Shaw, sure, Mara. Thanks, Dan. Alderman Keith Kerrigan. Here, Mara. Thanks, Keith. Alderman Hilary McClintock. Here, Mara. Thanks, Hilary. Councillor Keir Maguire. Chair Mora. Thanks, Kieran. Councillor Philip McKinney. Here, Mora. Thanks, Philip. Councillor Aileen Mellon. Chair Mora. Thanks, Aileen. And Councillor Sean Mooney. Here, Mora. Thanks, Sean. So just call out for um, Councillor Sean Harkin. Not coming back to me, Chair. So. Thank you, members. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks, Mara Fat. Um, I'm going to move on to the statement for remote meetings, and I'd like to remind everyone who's in remote attendance that this meeting will be broadcast live via Council's YouTube channel and will be available for viewing by the public and the media. The broadcast will also be available for repeated viewing at a later date. This broadcast may be terminated or suspended in accordance with Council protocol. Members and approved speakers are, there, are reminded they only have their mics and cameras on while speaking at the meeting and to use the chat facility to highlight a request to speak. By participating in the meeting, you're consenting to be informed and to the use and storage of those images for broadcasting or training purposes and for the purpose of keeping historical records and making those records available to the public. A copy of Council's privacy notice may be found on the Council website. Thank you, members. Um, now, um, moving on to the declarations of members' interests. Is there any members that have a declaration of interest in, for today's meeting? No. I'm going to move on now to chairperson's business and I know the head of planning has discussed a number of issues um, that she wishes to raise during chairperson's business and the first of which is um, an update on application that was previously at the committee in relation to Avis Road. Um, Mara, do you want to update members on that? Thanks Chair. Members, you've pre previously asked for an update in regard to um, an application on Avish Road that is, was, has been subject to an independent engineer's report. It's just to let members know that that report had been has been actually received and um, and that that information will be passed to yourselves and will also be um, uploaded in portal and passed to the applicant and agent in regard to that particular case. case. Um, it's just a reminder, members, that this was a case that um, committee made a, a decision on. However, it was held back through a, an Article 17 by DFA, at which they obviously returned some advice to the committee in regard to aspects of the planning application. Um, you will recall that um, officers recommended we sought legal advice on this and uh, the planning committee 
um, were aware of that. We, we got legal advice and we decided that we required to get an independent engineer's report. So it's just to let you know that that report's in and that officers are in a position now to bring that application back into the committee. And that's really all I wanted to update on, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mara. Members, is there anybody, any questions in relation to that? I know that application will um, be coming back before committee. Chair, could I come in there? Yeah, Councillor Kelly. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, this is um, this has been a long time um, coming. I think it must be nearly eighteen months, uh, maybe since we made a decision on this. Um, it's good to see that we're finally. I suppose the question I have really is when is when is this going to come back to report given or to committee? Given that we've already such a, a year and a half has elapsed since we first made a decision on this. Is there any indication uh, from um, officers when when that will be coming back? And I suppose the other thing is, will, will that report be be furnished to members um, as soon as that's available? Thanks, Chair. Yes, through the chair, Councillor Kelly. Yes, we will make the report available to all members of the planning committee after committee today. At the same time, we'll obviously let the applicant and the objector and the agent aware of the report as well, and then put it in the public domain in terms of the planning portal. And we will be making best endeavours to return this application to next month's planning committee, Councillor Kelly. Okay. Um, are you content, Councillor Kelly? Uh, Chair, uh, obviously there's nothing really to discuss because we haven't seen anything uh, yet. So um, yeah, um, but I'm um, just um, I suppose a, a further question is, will we get an opportunity to discuss the reports with the, the authors of the reports when that does come to committee? Okay. Chair, I wonder yeah. could I ask Eamon to come in on that, please? Thanks. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Thanks, Mara. Yes, Councillor, we, we, we will endeavour to have the uh, reports authors at, at the committee for any questions. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks for that, Dimon. Thanks, Councillor Kelly. Thank you, Chair. Um, Mara, another, or another issue that uh, Mara wishes to address with the committee or remind members is around the LDP roundtable discussion dates. Um, do you want to come on, Mark, Mark? Thank you, Chair. Members, you will have received um, recent emails in regard to the update in terms of the LDP diary dates for the, the roundtable discussions. It's just to alert you to the fact we have a roundtable discussion this Friday, the 7th, in the morning. We also have two other dates in the diary, which is the 13th of May and the 14th of May. And you, you will understand the reason for them being so close together is that we're obviously trying to dovetail the timelines for this um, in order to meet the special committee on the 24th of May. And again, we've discussed it with yourselves at the roundtable discussions in regard to the timeline and scheduling um, the programme in terms of getting the focus changes through. And of course, members are quite keen that we progress things as quickly as possible. So it's just to remind yourselves that we've, you've got that email and to hopefully put uh, the dates in the diary for those topics and areas that you're particularly interested in. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Mara. And just, just on that point, because I know the roundtable discussions are very are very important element of forming, a, a form, forming a, the LDP, but um, and time frames are very tight in, ter in terms of um, the, the the timetables for full council meetings and and getting these uh, getting any proposal brought to full council at the earliest opportunity. But um, so I would encourage all members they they attend and participate in the roundtable discussions, but also remind members that this is. Um, this is our local development plan, and if members don't feel members shouldn't feel rushed on it, um, and if members feel that, that, that we need new, more time, um, to reflect on some of the discussions that's taken place in the roundtable discussions, it it is within our own gift, and we 
um, it, it's it's a matter that's under the control of council. Whilst we all appreciate the need for this to progress as soon as possible, it has it has something that um, members retain an element of control over as well. So um, it would be good the it would be good to have um, the 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 participation from as many members as possible, um, and and to get this through as, as soon as possible. But um, in the same token, we the we we, we members shouldn't feel that but they were being rushed on anything either as well. Um, so I'm going to move on now to um, Mara just wants to update members on a recent PAC decision on. Could I come in on on that? On, on the, the date and the LDP won't go on here. Yeah. Thanks, Chair. I, I would be keen that we would press on with the dates that are there, and I think, uh, you know, withstanding the, the comments you made, and I agree with them, uh, we won't know if we need extra time until we actually sit down and round the table. So, I would be keen that we would uh, press on with those dates, get round the table, and for people who can't make it, uh, I mean, the, the the facility is there to, to to send in your comments, and they can be raised as part of the discussion. So, I think uh, I would be keen that we would press on with those dates and. If we can get through the business rather than um, sort of just kind of uh, unnecessarily delaying it for the sake of, we don't know yet till we get around the table what what's going to emerge. So the sooner we get around the table, you know, the the, the sooner the picture starts to clear and we can get an idea of where we're at and and get on with it. And we may get it done within the time frame, but um, may not, as you say, and we can make more time then. But at this stage, I think it's it's keen that I'd be keen to see us getting pushing on with it. Thanks, Chair. Um. And I, I concur completely um, that we concert here. I think it does. There is a clear direction that we, uh, from this committee, that we proceed as soon as possible. Um, and again, I look forward to the discussions at the round table. Um, they, they see if there's, and, and if there is a need, then I suppose it, 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 they for further meetings, it, it, um, it's something that can be explored. Um, is there any further comments on the roundtable discussions? No. Um, another item that um, Mara wishes to bring to your attention is a recent decision. Um, they overturn a decision of this committee um, on an application, or by the PAC on an application of Victoria Road. Um, Mara, do you want to come on yeah. on that? Thank you, Chair. Just a quick update, members, because it, this decision came in post the appeals update paper that went to yourselves, obviously, as part of the pack. This was the application of 8 to 10 Victoria Road, you will recall, um, where the committee made a decision on the, the 30th, sorry, made a decision last year, and that was an application 8 2014 0592F. The PAC, um, obviously, is the body in which a third party or an applicant, sorry, not a third party, an applicant can actually appeal um, any decision of, of the committee or of council. And that decision um, was made on the 30th of April, and that was following a hearing on the 14th of April, um, and that was with Clan Mill Developments. Um, so basically, the outcome of that decision was that the appeal was allowed subject to 13 conditions. I will arrange to send a copy of the actual appeal around members for their information, but it was just in order to update you on that because it was literally, it's just really been very recent and a just important um, decision that the committee made. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, um, Maura, and I, I agree that it was. It, it, it was a, it, there was very strong views coming from this committee in respect to that application, um, and it was dis disappointing to see that the decision of the committee overturned by the PAC. Members, is there any? Um, is anybody wishes to comment on that? No. Councillor Hergan, go on here. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, I, I share uh, similar concerns as to uh, yourself and all our councillors in terms of the overturning of this decision, uh, in terms of the, the role of our committee and the council. But I, I also, uh, I'm not sure we discussed this at the time, but we have discussed it 
since then about the issue of the the track beds um which which has been raised um uh for rail and uh given the importance we are attaching to the expansion of rail throughout the northwest there is concerns that moving ahead with this uh could could impact on that since uh this this is part of the site where there are existing um track beds from the historic rail line thank you chair thanks um sean Maura, do you want to come on on that chair just to advise that um there was no representation made in regard to that so it didn't you members will realize that that it wasn't subject to um consideration or discussion as a as any sort of a representation at the time whenever members were dealing with it at committee it's just a just a reminder that that wasn't an issue that was raised at the time thanks and, and i do recall there was there was quite a lot of discussion around around car parking and and the design of that particular building um but the, the, the issue around um the the railway line wasn't um brought up by by anybody during the, that application um i, I just suppose in, in terms of and this is what i'm going to ask follow up to come on um as in terms of the, the the situation now from this committee is there any recourse um for the committee on the the decision by the pac uh, only by means of a judicial review, um, Chair, would be the only option, and that would be in relation to um, an error of law um, and uh, that the PAC would have made in relation to the matter. It wouldn't be enough. It's not an appeal against the decision. Per se, it would, be, it would have to be an appeal against the process that the PAC had undertaken. Um, uh, I must admit I haven't looked at that yet. Um, uh, but it, uh, in a case such as this, it would be extremely unlikely that there would be any prospect for a successful uh, judicial review in relation to those matters. Okay. Um, is there anybody else wants to comment on that before we move on? Chair. Councillor Kelly. Yeah, I have, a vague, I have obviously seen the the appeal decision on it, but my recollection from the discussion of that at the at the committee was that the real bed was uh, discussed uh, in terms of a greenway cycleway route along the river, and that there was an access to that um, development from that. Um, I'm I'm not sure other people have a similar recollection. It probably didn't uh, feature largely in it because. I think the mind of the committee was that it, you know, eventually it wasn't going to be approved because of various other issues. But I, I do have a recollection that there was something around that being discussed at the time. It, it, it certainly doesn't form one of our, our refusion or refusal reasons. No, I'm not. I'm not saying that, but it did come into the discussion. Yeah. No. Um, well, fair enough point. Um, Councillor Boyle. Thank you, Chair. Um, just for clarity, actually, Chair, uh, that particular meeting, um, as I recall, was probably the only meeting that I wasn't in attendance at uh, this past 12 months. And funnily enough, it was because I was away in other council business associated with planning, uh, somewhere in that. But um, I have actually read uh, the, the PAC decision, or as best as I can. Uh, or as best as I could over the last couple of days with all of the other information that we've been reading with planning. Uh, and I think it would be worthwhile clearly to, to share that uh, that particular document with all members of the committee before any further decisions can be made about um, any particular uh, way of going forward. Um, but I think for the benefit of, of Councillor Kelly, because he mentions it, um, it is referenced in the, in, the, in the PAC decision, but it was evident to me as well that it was not uh, it was not something uh, that uh, the committee ha had had made too much of it um, uh, in terms of a refusal reason. That, that was my reading of it. But again, as I said, it's just for for the benefit of Councillor Kelly that it, that it shared that. Um, but certainly, it's a, a, the the decision makes for interesting, and I have to say, I share your view and the view of others. That's a, a, a disappointing decision too. 
Thank you. Um, and I suppose we can, uh, can we ask that that report be circulated to all members, um, the report from the PAC? Yes, that's no problem, Chair. I'm sure that that's circulated. Okay, thank you. Um, and I know um, when Councillor Boyle was um, was speaking there, he referenced um, all the other information that we've been reading over the last few days in respect to planning. And that brings me on to the late items. Um, members, I'll be just only too familiar that um, are only too aware that there's been quite a substantial amount of late items. And I'm going to ask Maura just to um, talk us through some the, the, the items that have been sent to us over the last few days. Thank you, Chair. So, members, we have received um, late items in relation to two planning application items on the agenda, and that's for number one, item number one, and item number 10. In terms of item number one, I'll just run through um, the list and um, hopefully you'll be able to keep up. Now, all of this has been sent to you in various emails coming from Lois, Lois McCain, and will all be in your inbox. Correspondence from Mark MacGyver, um, writing as planning agent on behalf of the objectors, received on the 27th of April 2021. Further correspondence received on the 29th of April 2021 and also on the 3rd of May. Correspondence from Matt Kennedy, acting as the planning agent, received on the 28th of April and also received further information on the 29th of April. With a further correspondence also from Barbara Kern, uh, objector received on the 29th of April, on the 30th of April, a further um, piece of correspondence on the 30th of April, further correspondence on the 4th and another one on the 4th. Correspondence from Una McNally, um, the 29th of April, the 4th of May and the 5th of May. That's today. Correspondence from Aileen Hastings received on the 4th of May. And again, you would have just got that today. Also further to that, in terms of item 10, um, we've received correspondence from Desmond O'Neill, and that's the agent for that particular application. And that was received only on the 3rd of May. And again, correspondence from Daniel Crossan, McCrossan, uh, MLA, and that was received on the 3rd of May also. So members, that's um, clearly the, the number of and, and variety of correspondence that we've put before you. And just a reminder to the chair, clearly we need time for members um, to consider that if they need if they need to, depending on the extent and the time and uh, in advance of the item being heard. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Ma. Councillor McGuire. Can I ask a question? Sorry. Yeah. Um. I'm count. I'll. Any uh, councillor Mellons and I'm um, right. I'll bring you in. Right. Sorry. Right. Um, councillor Mellon. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to come in and ask. I know Maura has let, read out the, the list of lead items. Thank you, Maura. Um, I'm just more referring to the dates you know, that they're coming in at. I know um, it was the bank holiday weekend and they're coming last week, but this is only in the last 24 hours that we have received this information, some of it really important um, to both the applicant and other parties in relation to item one specifically. Uh, and I just want to say um, that, for instance, um, I know members here, we have all our commitments, we're really busy, um, and that's not taking away the importance of the planning committee, but we have to do our due diligence as well. and. I'm just concerned um, at how, you know, we have items already deferred before and we're coming here today and I'm aware that um, there is a large file that I personally am unable to open. I've seen our members writing back as well that they had um, from looking at it seems to be um, the 89 page document. Uh, I would I would question whether that, you know, could that if we're considering lead items here today and we take a minute, I would need 
need an hour on itself. Um, but I just want to air my frustration um, at how this process is holding up planning committee and our ability to take forward applications and make informed decisions. Uh, and I'm sure for everybody involved, it is a frustrating time. Um, uh, I'm just, I'm really, um, I suppose, frustrated at the fact that we, you know, I, I can only speak for myself, but I'm not furnished with all the information that's within them emails. I have another job and we have other commitments, as does everybody here on this call. So for me, I, I'm uneasy the fact that, you know, these applications can be um, for right or wrong, in purpose or not, um, can keep being kicked down the road because we're continuously bringing in lit items. Um, and I think th maybe that's a conversation or discussion that members want to have. Um, but it's certainly frustrating that um, we can't go on the, the report that officers have taken the time to, to do it and the time that applicants and objectors um, look to see the informed the information that they have to inform their decisions on what might benefit or impact them. Um, I just want to put that out to the floor, Chair. Thank, thank you, Eileen. And I suppose um, it's it's an issue that's been raised continuously at this committee, and we've um, we all share your frustration. Um, and I, and I know it's something that formed a large part of our response to the review of the legislation. Because um, there does need, or in our view, we, we there does need to be a cut off time because there's a substantial report that's been presented in front of us that officers have presented, um, and and subsequent to that report being prepared, um, there has been an an influx of of, of substantial and I might have led information some on um, pretty technical do documents that um, it's. That members are expected to get their head around. Members and officers are expected to get their head around um, within a very short time frame. So I can understand um, your frustrations and your concerns, and I would be keen to hear all our members' views on it as well. Um, Councillor McGuire, do you want to come on now, or is it on a different issue? It was just in relation to uh, one of the uh, the feedback was from Des, Desmond O'Neill. Uh, does that mean now that uh, refusal reason four on item 10 is now removed in light of that email? Or will we deal with that when it comes up at item 10? Sorry, Chair, I can, I just didn't get a chance to finish off on item 10, but if you want me to deal with item 10 now, I can, or we can do it after item one. I think, I think we should deal with the lit items in, in relation to item one uh, first, first okay. and then we'll come back and discuss um, the item 10. Um, Councillor McKinney. Thank you, Chair, for letting me in. And my sentiments are exactly the same as what uh, Councillor, uh, what Aileen has said there, and yourself, Chair. Um, really for, I think really for fairness and transparency, really, on both parties in item one. I would much rather this was deferred, but I would like to point out to the parties that we do need this brought to an end, and we do need to have some sort of um, sensible about this. These sort of would come across as um, what I would call, maybe I'm wrong here, but stalling tactics. Uh, and I would like, I personally would like to get the issue resolved, but I, I think in fairness uh, and transparency, we really do need to maybe defer it and give the other parties a chance to uh, look at the, the items in front of us and us as councillors to make a decision need to have a fair amount of time to discuss the items that have been brought to us lately. Thank you. Okay. Um, and I, I just note that um, picking up from Councillor Mellon's comments um, it was very, pretty much on the same vein and Councillor Gallagher has concurred with what you had said. So. Um, I'm going to take that as a proposal to defer item one, given the sheer volume of late information that, that members are expected um, to consider before taking a decision on that. So um, I'm going to I'm taking that as a proposal, Councillor McKinney. Um, I'm bringing then bring Councillor Boylan. Do you wish to speak on that proposal? 
I do chair. Um, and I think um, applicants and objectors, for, for no matter what application we have in front of us, should uh, perhaps consider what, what uh, the previous speakers have said. Um, the volume of, of information um, that came at members of this committee was actually phenomenal and, uh, uh, and not something uh, that I had seen before. Uh, and I mean that as no criticism. I know people want to get information in front of us. Um, but, but where I'm now uncomfortable is that there are fellow members of this committee um, who, who who just simply feel that they, they can't make a decision. And we don't want to be in that position, Chair. We don't want to be in a position with four or five people on this committee. I'm sure applicants and objectors would prefer those four or five people were comfortable and could vote uh, on, on, a, on an application. Um, so uh, I, I think it's important. Uh, you, you know, the legal system in itself out there, and this is a, this a quasi-judicial situation that we're in, you know, there are cut-off points in high court proceedings and things like that. Um, uh, uh, so I'm supportive of, 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 of uh, a deferral. Uh, as I, I, I wasn't of a mind to do that today, but, you know, I, I, if others are concerned, then I support, I support the idea. I think everybody deserves an opportunity, the proper opportunity to consider all of the information, because one of the challenges, um, evidently, as you know, that we get argument and counter argument and, and further argument, and further counter argument, it all comes into us in a bundle. Um, uh, and we're trying to work our way through a bundle, which has not been particularly well organized for us to, to read through. And, and when you're only looking at it in emails and it's not a paper, uh, it's not a paper uh, exercise, that's even more difficult. So. Uh, in fairness to everybody who's already spoken, I, I think the ferals to be fair to this committee, and I, I regret to say that to the objectors and indeed the applicant today, uh, I know that they were perhaps keen to get on with it, um, but I'm sure they would want us to make a well-informed decision at the end of all of this. Yeah, um, thank you, Councillor Boy. Councillor Mellon, briefly on that. Yeah, Chair, I just thought I would um, just make one point on the issue of transparency. And for members here, we deal with applications in an unbiased as much as humanly possible way. Um, and I just wanted to put on record that I have seen that um, myself included and other members in this planning committee have been tagged on social media. And I would like to say that that in no way will contribute or has contributed to any decision that this committee has taken today. And in fact, it hinders um, transparency. And we're here as individual members and we take it on the basis of the information that we have been provided with. And I just want to state that that is in no way any um, reflection on the, the views that I have had here today. And I just wanted that on record, Chair. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, and again, I would concur. Um, so members, um, um, I'm going to, based on the sheer volume of, of all that information and the views from members um, um, and, and allowing the OI members time to consider the, the information that was submitted, I'm going to um, take it that that, um, mem that application number one will be removed from the schedule of today's meeting. Are members content? With that point, yeah. So, um, item number one has been removed from the schedule. Um, I'm going to move now to um, the late information in respect to item number ten, and I'm going to bring Maura back and the answer the question from Councillor McGuire around the refusal reason for it. Thank you, Chair. In regards to item 10, um, I just wanted to update members on the basis of the information that has been received from um, the agent, Desi O'Neill, on the 3rd of May. That is a particularly, um, it's, it's actually a, a drawing um, with sight lines, which the officers needed, obviously, to deal with in terms of processing the application. On that basis, um, I would be recommending Chair, that um, we need to consult road service in regard to this before um, the committee would make a decision. So um, I would be recommending that we've been given time to do that and bring the, the application back following um, that consultation. Thank you. 
Okay, so um, Mara, that's a recommendation that um, we also defer item number 10, the allow consultation with DFA Roads. Um, any views from members or members content with that approach? Yeah, Councillor McKinney, Councillor Boyle in agreement. Is there anybody that doesn't agree with that approach? Okay, so item yeah. number 10. Just, just wondering if it's necessary, Chair, um, you know, when, when the sight lines are there. I mean, uh, road service knows this, is this not what they were asking for? On the chain. Okay. Maura, do you want to come back on that? Or? Just to say it would be my recommendation that we would seek the the advice from road service in terms of the position with the revised drawn. It's it's normal practice that we would do that. Um but it's a matter of members if they want to proceed without that advice or the consultation response. But that's just me obviously recommending you from you know our normal practice. Thank you. Okay. So Councillor McGuire, the, the advice is that it's um that we do consult. Are you suggesting that we don't? Chair, um, how long will that take then? You know, just. More, are we in a position? Does to, I mean, does it have to go out to consultation again, or is it just uh, emailing it in and it could be back next month or what? Well, it would have to go through the normal process in terms of consultation because road service wouldn't respond unless we did, you know, did that in the normal way. But we could obviously um, chair prior ask for prioritization. We do have a system in place with um, the divisional roads manager, so we can obviously do our best, you know, to speed that process up under the circumstances. Councillor McGuire, if that would be helpful. Yeah, if it could, yeah, please. Okay. Um, Alderman Kerrigan. No, no, I think, I think, sorry, Chair, thanks for letting me in. I think Morris can answer that. If it was going to take six months, I would rather face it today. But if it was going to be, if it could be reasonably quickly to get a response back from, from Rhodes, I'd be content to let it sit to, if it was to say the start of, start of June. But if it was going to drag out and wipe out the rest of the year, I would rather try to maybe push it through the day. But if Morris can answer the question anyway, thanks, Chair. Okay, so we're going to that item number ten is deferred to for to the consultation with DFA roads members. If 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 there is any member, if there's any concerns um, down the road around um, any delay in this application come back, um, I would expect members of this committee to raise it, and in turn. We can have further correspondence with road service, but in the meantime, um, we are we'll we'll include in when in their correspondence that we request that it's prioritised. Um, so, um, in 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 respect to, uh, I'm going to move on now to the running order, and, um. They accommodate those who have requested speaking rights. Um, I'm going to rearrange the running order to bring those applications forward. So the first application will be two, then three, then eight and nine, and then four, five, six, and seven. So hope everybody got that. Um, applications number one and application number ten have been withdrawn from the schedule. So it, it's it's two, three, eight, and nine, and then four, five, six, and seven. So I'm going to move on, members. Um, out of chairperson's business and the matters are rising from the open minutes of the special planning committee meeting held on Wednesday, the 24th of March. Um, is there any matters arising from the minutes of that meeting? No. 
Moving on to matters arising from the open minutes of the planning committee held on Monday the 12th of April. Is there any matters arising from the minutes of that meeting? No. Moving straight into the applications then and um, with item number one withdrawn, um, the next application is item number two. It's LA 11 2020 It's an outline application that Laura is going to take us through. Are you ready, Laura? Yep, thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, members. Um, Item two on the agenda is LA eleven. Just, just before you start, um, can we get the presentation up on the screen? Can you not see it? No. Um, sorry. Is that okay now? That's perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, so um, item two in the agenda, LL 11 2020 um, is an outline planning application for a dwelling and a domestic garage um, site adjacent um, to and 45 metres west of 22 Barnesport Road. Um, the recommendation is to refuse. So this slide shows the site location plans so that it works. So Submitted with the planning application. Um, so the site is a parcel of land within a larger agricultural field. Um, it's fairly level and it sits slightly below the road. Um, so this just outlines the relevant planning policy, which includes the Strabane Area Plan, the SPPS, PPS 21, PPS 3, PPS 2, and PPS 15. Um, so the aerial photo here um, shows the proposed site. Um, um, it's location along alongside a row of dwellings, um, and then um, further approval, which is located down there in the in the corner of the, the image. Um, the site's openly visible whenever you're travelling along Barnesport Road um, in both directions, um, due to the the lack of established boundaries. Um, so this shows photos of the application site when um, viewed looking towards it from the west. Um, you can see um, one of the dwellings there um, in the distance, and then and the other view is from the application site um, looking down towards um, the site that's been approved there. Um, so the main policy consideration for this proposal is um, policy CTY8 of PPS 21. Um, so it states that plan permission will be refused for a building which creates or adds to a revenue of development, but then an exception will be permitted for the development of a small gap site sufficient to accommodate up to a maximum of two houses within an otherwise substantial and continuously built up frontage. And the policy defines this frontage as a line of three or more buildings along the road frontage. Um, and consider a ration of this proposal, um, the application site is located at the end of a row of dwellings. Um, the plan and approval, um, which is there and um, is currently unimplemented, um, apart from the, the garage, does not form um, part of the substantial and continuously built up frontage. Um, it doesn't, we consider that it doesn't visually link with the application site due to the separation distance and the mature vegetation, um, which creates a substantial visual break. Um, the application site and the adjoining land, which we would consider together, do not constitute um, a small gap site sufficient to accommodate up to a maximum of two houses. Um, this would, this, this um, total area would be able to accommodate up to approximately three dwellings. Um, the proposal wouldn't respect the existing pattern of development in terms of frontage, length and flat size along the side of the road. Um, and the dwelling at this location would add add to the existing ribbon of development that is there, um, as you can see from the row of dwellings. Therefore, it's considered that the proposal is considered the policy CTY 8 and CTY 14 of PPS 21 as it, as it would add to a ribbon of development. 
Um, however, we also consider a proposal in terms of the other policies within PPS 21 um, and specifically policy CTY 13. Um, so, as I said, the site's clearly visible with travel along the road. Um, it doesn't benefit from any long established boundaries and would rely heavily, therefore, on new planting to provide integration. And as such, we don't consider the proposal to comply with policy CTY 13. Um, we also consider um, the proposal in terms of amenity. Um, it's located um, close by to a sand on gravel quarry and the proposed Atlantic for the A5. Um, environmental Health had requested submission of a noise impact assessment um, to ensure that the future occupants um, of the dwelling wouldn't be adversely affected by um, amenity in terms of noise. Um, but to date, this has not been received, um, so therefore we cannot rule out any potential um, adverse impacts on immunity. And as such, the proposal will be contrary to the SPPS. Um, so in terms of PPS 3, um, DFI roads have considered amended plans that were submitted and they have no objections to the proposal. Um, SAS have carried out a HRA on behalf of Council. Um, both SES and NED have no objections and have provided um, advice and conditions. Um, and in terms of PPS 15, um, DFI Rivers requested that a five metre maintenance strip is provided, um, given the extent of the site this can be achieved. Um, so overall, um, we consider that the proposal um, is not acceptable in principle. Um, in terms of policy CTY1, CTY8 and CTY14 of PPS 21, and also that the site fails to integrate, therefore it's contrary to policy CTY 13. And also um, we consider that there's not sufficient information um, to determine um, the impacts or the potential impacts on immunity of the future residents. So therefore the proposal is contrary to the FPPS. Okay, thank you, Laura. Um, can I invite David McKinley to address the committee? Madam Chair, yes, can you hear me? You're very welcome, David. David, you've thank got you. five minutes. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, committee, for allowing me to speak. Um, basically, the start with the SSES are back to their content uh, with a standard 10 meter zone. NA wanted a 20 meter zone from that, that, that sort of shocked the back. Uh, which gives us another way to go along, but it, it, it is achievable. Those are back in their content, and there's no objections from the general public. Um, I sort of read the planning office report and comments as follows CTY 8 to start with the dwelling on the construction at the western extent of the application has judged that's one dwelling. Uh, it, it, it has started, has commenced, but as long as some part of the development has commenced, it's taken as, as the approval as. Sustained that dwelling is actually nearly, com nearly complete now, it's ready for roof next week. So we'll have two buildings as we speak on one side. However, I'm not relying on that. I have two buildings uh, within site number 22, which is the, the start and the end of the bookmark I require for, for the gap site. Um, so basically, the, so the, 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 therefore the book end and our gap is reinforced now with two number buildings to the west, requiring one number dwelling. At the eastern boundary, which is 22. Now we also have two buildings in 22, a garage and a house, both fronting the public road. Uh, as the map indicates, the uh, figures, well, no, sorry, I'm not going back to that. But if Laura would put up, could Laura put up the, uh, sorry, my cell phone, could Laura put up the site contacts for him again, please, if it's all possible? Um, the other part of, of, of CTY8, or CTY8, the site's a similar size, it's 20, number 22, yes, it's. 42 to 43 meters. Number 20 is 42 to 44 meters. Number 18 is 44 meters wide. This is site frontage. Building site is 41. Number 21 and number 21 is opposite the site. That site is 111 meters long. And, and when I take an average of the existing sites that's there, that gives me a frontage of almost 280 meters divided by five. It's 50, 57 meters of frontage. We are slightly bigger than that. Granted that we've been expected to rear development. We're not we'll, we'll not be expected to develop to the rear of this site, so we'll have to provide a, a longer bungalow to the front. Uh, that together with the little bit of planting that I've shown uh, to separate the sites uh, on my sketch plan, which I, I don't see it's been put up, but uh, I think if you read through the planning file, you'll see that. That gives me 
sites of similar sizes right the way through. So at this point, I think we have an average site probably similar to the rest of them that is there. Uh, so I think we comply. Uh, CTY 14, planning service going on a visual break, multicultural landing buildings. As you approach the site from Newton Stewart from the east, number 14, not shown in my plan, but to the to the left of number 18, you can see a gap between that. That gap's about 124 metres. Now, as you approach our site, you don't actually see that. You see number 14 first, then you see a little gap, then you see 18, 20, and 22. That is continuous about the front is granted, but as you go around the corner and you can see the bend of 22, that then is when the new frontage starts. So we conclude that you start at 22, you have our gap site, and uh, possibly the potential the second one, and then the development that is approved, uh, you can see on the bottom 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 left, uh, the house and the garage, that's virtually finished now. So it's, you've got buildings on both sides, and that starts and finishes our gap. So to me, CTY 14 doesn't add to a ribbon. Uh, it's within policy of CTY 8, and that's permitted if, it, if it's within a set of development limits. And visually, visually it ties between 22 and the site that's been built at present because of the bend in the road. Uh, integration CTY 16, there are many forms of integration. For example, the north and directly adjacent to 21 uh, is full of trees. That's as a plantation. To the south of the site, the red and the blue, is a large bank, approximately 20 to 30 metres tall. Um, you, you don't always rely and you don't always have the benefit of trees to integrate, but in this case, we have land form, uh, and that's quite important. Uh, so, I contest there is integration, might not be in trees. We are adding trees, but we're not making a site with trees. There's enough landfill or land form to develop an enclosed site. In regards to point five, uh, J2009 0400 RM was the, the dwelling and garage that's currently being constructed. Now, that was approved during the life of the core. Uh, I'm not sure the 2022, 20 or 18, they all, as I understand, grew up around the quarry. The quarry just didn't start and finish. Uh, so I contest that the request for a sound requirement was, was, was ridiculous in that we already have an approval there. Uh, and by the way, uh, we've been speaking to the, the landowner who now tells me that the quarry is, is, is now ceased and it will be put back into a field in this next year coming, 2023. So I think the quarry element is gone. Uh, and, and it shouldn't really have been an issue in the first instance. Um, to conclude, I think you do comply with 8, 13, and 14. Uh, I'll leave it with yourselves, guys. If you have any questions, I'll be more than likely to come. Thank you. Thank you, David. Members, have you any questions? Alderman Kerrigan. Chair for allowing me in. <clears throat> I'm just seeking to confirm there uh, uh, that Mr. McKinley is raised there. That, um, or or um, uh, he may not be aware. Uh, say that that the site which he is referring to, which is uh, ready for the roof. Uh, I can't just recall the number of it there. That's that would have been closer to the quarry. But as you state, the quarry now has ceased trading and is going to be going to be going to be. Uh, I suppose the, the tenure of that quarry has now ceased, and it's and it's going to be returned then to agricultural ground again for the the the, the landowner, the farmer. Um, Absolutely so, right. Yeah. And, and your and your case saying then that's not going to be an issue, and I'm just querying on that one then as well. But again, you, you have touched on it then, in regards to to that being a gap site there, uh, in regards to the size of the dwelling house on the opposite side of the road. Um, and in comparison to that, there whereby that field w which you're seeking to, to, to get the permission on is a equivalent, you could trip two houses in that if you're looking at the house on the, on the opposite side of the road. Is my my look on it here when I'm looking on it on the map? But it's, yeah. it's the, the, the case there of um, that, sorry, where I was going from there. The, the quarry is not an issue. This is this is ultimately have to because you've you've got confirmation that the quarry is ceasing to trade. And was that where I was coming from? There, were you aware of the application of the house that is being built? It had required uh, documentation in regards to uh, noise levels from the quarry or amenity no. levels, but you may not have been aware no, of that. I, I, check, I checked that file. There was no request for that. No. Thank you, David. Okay. Thanks, Alderman Kerrigan. Members, is there any other questions for David? 
No. Thank you, David. Okay. Um, any questions for Laura? Or any comments, members? Chair, can I come on with just one question? Yeah, Councillor Mooney. I was just wondering to ask Laura, would she have uh, confirmation of the quarries closing down? Has uh, Council been informed about it in any way? Um, Councillor Mooney, no, we haven't received any notification that the quarries are closing. Um, and as far as I'm aware, there was an application um, a few years ago to extend the operating um, time of the quarry. Um, but no, we haven't received any notification that it's closing. Okay, Hugh, you, you content? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, Alderman Kerrigan. I, I, I couldn't get the unmute button there. Uh, I, I'm not, sorry, Chair. I was going to come out with something smart there, but I'll just I'll hold my tongue in regards to quarries and, and applications and how long it takes to get them through. So we'll, we'll say nothing. Um, no, Chair, I've looked at this application there and I've looked at the reasons there. Um, again, SPPS CTY1, uh, PPS21, um, I would be minded that, that the Stavan area plan and the rural remainder 123.2.1 uh, uh, covers that first refusal reason. Uh, the SPPS uh, CTY8 and CTY14 the PPS21 uh, ribbon development and further eroding the rural character. I, my looking at it there, I, I would know that area brave and well. I, I, it's in the DEA, but I would know a number of people that live uh, very close to that site. Uh, and uh, um, the Hamiltons and, and various ones in that area there. So I'd be minded it's, it's I would be minded it's more of a gap site. And my opinion of it, the, the dwelling house is directly opposite. I, I know that Laura has stated there that that site and her view there would accommodate uh, three dwelling houses. But um, with the restriction that has been put on it, that they they have to stay away from the back boundary. You're you're going for more road frontage with a dwelling house. So I would be minded that there's a gap site for no more than two dwelling houses, and it was with relation to the dwelling house and the size of the dwelling house opposite it. Um, so I would be minded it's not ribbon, but more of a gap site. Um, again, SPPS CTY14 and PPS21 suburban style build up and further road the rural character. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't agree with that. I would be minded that it's very much. Uh, if you travel along the the Barnscourt Road. There are wee clusters and wee pockets of houses very similar to this. What 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 is uh, on this location? Um, and again, the the SPPS number four SPPS uh, CTY thirteen lack of boundaries. Um, say I would know that road very well, and and you're on a wee bit of a dip there, and and I mean, you you're past that before you see it. You're really only seeing it from the, from from the road. Uh, you know, there is a large bank there to the back of that ground there. Uh, it slopes into a point in that field that comes behind those houses, 18, 20 and, and 22. Uh, and, uh, you know, you wouldn't have much of a view from it. What Exactly, that that, that um, uh, point of a field that is directly behind there, as, as the map's up there now, uh, that comes in between, that's, that's um, if you're looking at that there, if you're driving along the road, you're just looking into a hill there. So, so I would be minded that there's, uh, it's, it's the lie of the land in that regard, and with the large trees on the opposite side, that site's actually had without a, without having a, a line of trees and bushes making a secure boundary around it. I would be minded that site is quite well had, and you're past it before you'd really realise it. It might look on the map like that's a brave size of a field there, but realistically, it's not. When you're on the road, I'd be minded that you know, and there's a substantial hedge on the dwelling house at twenty one opposite it. So I don't see that it's going to impact on visual amenity or or um, that that the lack of boundaries is really going to affect the site. And I am minded as well in regards to. Uh, <clears throat> The fifth point there that that it has been answered that quarry. I, I from information I had had uh, that, that that quarry was seeking to cease that the lease was up on that, um, or was very very shortly up on it. 
but uh, uh, that was that was information I had myself. But um, you, you, you know, so I, I'm minded. And again, if the application on the other dwelling house didn't require noise level uh, and amenity, I'd be minded that it's, it's it's not necessarily needed there for this one. So for those reasons, Chair, I would be minded to propose that we reject the officer's recommendation and that we grant planning permission. I think I've sort of got something out of that, Chair. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Holden McKagan, and, and amongst all that, I didn't pick up any questions, the officer, but um, the points were very well made. Um, let me bring in now Councillor McGuire. Okay, Chair. Chair, to me, uh, everything is hinging on uh, CTY8 and the urban development, and you know that that overrides the CTY14 and, and probably even the CTY13. Uh, I can't speak for the quarry. Nobody seems to have the, the answer to the quarry. But in CTY8, an exception will be permitted for the development of a small gap site. You know, and to me, this is a small gap site. You know, um, it, it wouldn't accommodate three houses, in my opinion. So, for that reason, for that reason, uh, I, I don't think it's it's changing the rural character. Uh, it's not urban development. It's uh, it's the exception, and CTY eight. Uh, so for that reason, again, I, I would second the proposal of Councillor Kerry. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, um, Councillor McGuire. Any further comments, members, or any questions? I want to give Laura an opportunity. Do you wish to come in on any, any other points that have been raised? Um, no, Councillor Jackson, I think, have covered everything. Okay. Um, members, if there's no further co comments or questions, there's a proposal from Alderman Kerrigan, seconded by Councillor McGuire. I'm going to they, they overturn the officer's recommendation, they refuse and they approve the application. Um, I'm going to um, ask Alderman Kerrigan um, in terms as a proposer um, for some sort of direction around conditions, as standard conditions for what is an outline application. Chair. Hello. Be content with standard conditions. Yeah, sorry, Chair. Yeah. Um so there's a proposal from Alderman Kerrigan, second to be Councillor McGuire. They approve the application that's in front of us. Um is there anybody in opposition? To that proposal. Um, it's not unanimous, members, so I'm going to ask um, Mara to take us to a vote. Thank you, Chair. Members, this is for item two, and it's a proposal to overturn the recommendation of the officers in regard to this particular application um, to approve the proposal. Councillor Jason Barr. Barr. Thank you. Councillor John Boyle. Against. Alderman Alan Breslin. Not here yet. Not in yet. Okay. Councillor Angela Dobbins isn't here either. Councillor Paul Gallagher. Or. Thank you. Councillor Sean Harkin. Or. Councillor Christopher Jackson. Or. Councillor Dan Kelly. Or. Alderman Keith Kerrigan. 
Or Mara. Okay. Alderman Hallery McClintock. Or. Okay. Councillor Kim McGuire. Mara. Yeah. Councillor Philip McKinney. Or Mara. Or. Got it. Okay. Councillor Aileen Mellon. Or Mara. Okay. And Councillor Sean Mooney. Against Mara. Okay. Sure, that's 10 for and two against. Okay. Thank you, Mara. Um, so that application has been approved. I'm going to move on now to our next application. And it's a, again, it's LA 11 2021 it's, it's Appendix D in our packs. And again, it's Laura that's going to take us through this. Over to you, Laura. Sorry, I just get my time out there. Sorry there for the delay. Um, so item three is LA 11 2021 um, and it's an outline application for a dwelling um, and domestic garage and it's a site adjacent to and immediately northeast of Nine Kelpro Road, Castle Derk, and the recommendation is to refuse. Um, so this is the site location plan again submitted with the planning application with the site outlined in red. Um, the application site for roadside plot. It's located on the northern side of, Bel of the road and um, between two existing dwellings. Um, site relatively flat. Um, so this is a relevant policy, which is considered um, in, in this proposal, Straban Area Plan, the SPPS, PPS 21, PPS 3 and PPS 2. Um, so as you can see from the the, the strong um, the aerial photo that the site's located between between two dwellings um, and opposite to agricultural buildings. Um, each of the dwellings have um, um, all our um, outbuildings, but these are located to the rear of the dwellings, and um, therefore they're not visible from the road. Um, the site is also um, obscured from view when traveling along the road due to the due to the these buildings and their cartilages. Um, this is just a view of the application site from the agricultural gate. Um, and these are views then when traveling along the road um, in both directions um, towards the site. Um, again, you can see that it's obscured from view. Um, so policy CTY8 um, again is the main consideration um, for this proposal. Um, which again states that plan permission will be refused for a building which creates or add day ribbon, but there's an exception um, permitted for a small gap site sufficient to accommodate up to two houses within an otherwise substantially built up frontage, and this is defined as a line of three or more buildings. Um, so this application site is located between two dwellings, um, it's therefore not considered to be a built up frontage. Um, as I said previously, the garage and shed at number nine is set at the rear of the dwelling and does not have a frontage onto the road, um, as to the garage at number 11, which is set back behind the dwelling. And it's not possible then when traveling along Kelcrow Road. Um, therefore, this, this section of the road is not considered to have substantial and continuously built up frontage, and therefore the proposal does not constitute a gap set, site to set out in policy CTY8. Um, therefore, a new dwelling on this site would create a row of um, buildings and create a ribbon of development. Therefore, the proposal is contrary to policy CTY8 and CTY14 of PPS21. 
Um, in terms of integration, integration um, policy CTY 13, um, as I've said, an approach from the site is generally screened by view for the existing development um, and the boundary vegetation. So when we consider this um, in the limited views, we could, it's possible for a new dwelling to integrate onto this landscape. Um, in terms of residential amenity, which is considered by the SPPS, um, given the extent of the site, it's considered that there's enough um, private amenity space available. Um, it could be cited so that there won't be any overlooking or loss of light into the neighbouring properties, um, subject to appropriate design. Um, environmental health had also raised um, concerns regarding the silage clamp and animal housing um, and an underground slurry tank, um, but this is located within the lands being um, within the applicant's control. Therefore, we'd be able to just provide advice in this respect. Um, so, DFI Roads have considered the proposal and they have no objections. Um, and in terms of um, natural heritage PPS2, there's no water course directly above the site. Um, but given the proximity of the site um, to protected water courses, um, SES were consulted informally. Um, and they've, they've concluded that due to the scale, location, and nature of the proposal, it would be unlikely to affect any um, of the designated sites. Um, so overall, having considered the proposal, um, we consider that it's contrary to policy CTY1, um, CTY8 and CTY14 of PPS21, um, and that the proposed development would create a ribbon of development, um, which is detrimental to the rural character and visual unity of the area. Thanks, Laura. Um, again, can I invite David McKinley to address the committee? Thank you, Chair. Uh, Laura, can I ask you to leave it just there if you don't mind? Are you happy enough with that? That's lovely. Yeah. Um, basically, CTY, I'm a little bit lost in this one. Uh, this to me is a textbook case for a gap site. Site number 11 is the northern site. It clearly shows the, the dwelling number 11, and it also shows the garage. Why does it sit behind? It does actually view onto the road. Now, I did furnish the planning service with the front elevations of that, and you can clearly see the garage behind it. Now, at some stage, that garage may well have extended behind number 11, but there is two building, buildings at that particular site fronting the public road. Uh, absolutely. Uh, number nine uh, is the applicant's site. He has, he has a dwelling, and there is, if you look at the location map there, too, there's actually a, a part of the building. So we're, we're treating number nine as the one one building on one side of the gap, and we're treating number eleven at the other side of the gap. That's the two bookends, uh, two bookends for it. So as, as far as I'm aware, and Sharon, I think this satisfies completely CPY8 uh, without any any further any further requirements for anything else on it. Uh, in regards to CTY13, uh, CTY13, sorry, fourteen hour. If it's not construed as a gap, it would be construed as a as, as ribbon development. Well, I, I see that it completely meets the requirements of CTY 8, therefore CTY 14 doesn't exist um, by, 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 by default. So continuous and front, front, continuously built up frontage is sustained by 11 with two buildings at site number 11 and one building at number 9 or dwelling. And a transient line between number 9 and number 11 can, sit, can satisfy a small Single story dwelling quite quite easily. Um, in regards to visual linkage, now the photographs that Laura had shown actually were better than in the planning thing. You can go back one or two there just to show the photographs of the site. I think it was the site context barn or adjacent buildings, I can't remember. Um, no, we're really photographs of the roofs. One more there. That's the photograph. So, no, back one more. Well, even that photograph, you can clearly see the dwelling, which is number 11. You can see 11 in the distance. Uh, and you can see number nine right beside us. Yes, there's a laurel hedge to number nine. However, it only goes a certain height. Uh, you can almost see the garage. You can see the garage, which if the front line hedge wasn't there, if the front hedge next to the road wasn't there, you would clearly see a little bit of a garage behind and, and, and the dwelling in front. So look, the, the elements of CTY8 is there consistently there. Uh, and you can see number 11 in the distance. It's, it's quite clear as well. Yes, there's a strong hedge row between the two, but there is Intervisual linkage between between that to, to sort of give us a little bit of confidence in, in CTY 14. Uh, a rest in case, I, I think this is a very clear cut CTY 8 uh, gap sites almost textbook. Uh, thank you, thank you, Chair, for, for taking the time to listen to me. Thank you. Thank you, um, David. 
Members, is there any questions for Mr. McKinley? No. Thank you, Mr. McKinley. Um, move, moving on now to questions to the officer. Um, has anybody any questions for Lyle? Councillor McGuire. Thank you, Chair. Um, if we go back to figure two, Chair, you know, um, I have to say, Chair, that, that is blatantly obvious, the, the garage at number 11 facing the road. And a quick scan of Google Maps or Google Street View will show clearly the garage uh, facing uh, the road. Uh, I've been on that road quite often, Chair, I'm well aware of it. Uh, as well as the applicant's house, given not the full garage is shown, but there is a uh, uh, a good part of it, not a significant part of it, but a good enough part to you know that it's a, a permanent structure there. Uh, so, Chair, I, I do not know uh, how uh, we're sitting dealing with this application. This this should have been, in my view, straight through. We've heard tell of finely balanced, but this isn't finely balanced. This is clear cut, Chair, in, in my opinion, and I'm sure a lot of people's opinion. Uh, so for, for that chair, uh, what we're hanging on uh, again is CTY8. And CTY8 gives an exception will be permitted for the development of a small gap site sufficient to accommodate a maximum of two houses and, and the rest, but I'm not going to read it out. But to me, this is the, the uh, stone wall clear cut gap site for two houses uh, on the Kilcrow Road. So uh, with that in mind, Chair, uh, uh, the CTY8 uh, overrides the CTY14 in, in my view. So with that in mind, Chair, I propose we do not accept the officer's recommendation. Uh, I propose that. Okay, thank you. Um, can I bring Suzanne on? Thanks, Chair. Um, it's really just to clarify the policy interpretation on these these cases, because clearly, you know, we're very well aware of, of, of the views on these. But I mean, this side here, um, I appreciate the garage is to the rear, but I mean, the policy requires a line of three buildings. There is not a line of three buildings on that map, right? Um, so I would disagree that, you know, we should be interpreting the policy that way. And that's why the officers, when we're looking at these on the ground, um, are, are being consistent. Um, we're applying CTY8 as we feel appropriate. We're taking on view the, the, the recent PAC decisions on the matter. Um, and I appreciate members don't agree with that. But however, in terms of the site itself, it's clearly lacks integration. Okay. Um, however, you know, in terms of, well, in terms of the road frontage, but the site itself is part of a larger site. Okay. This is the site here. The red line is the site in consideration. There's another half of the field there that's going to be, um, whatever, you know, that's not being considered here. So this is only part of a gap. Okay. Um, so I think we need to be very clear on the policy interpretation that the officers are taking and what we're putting to members. Totally respect the position on this. Um, and in our view, that garage to the rear of number 11 does not clearly contribute to a line of three buildings. As set out the back, I mean, the a number, the other one beneath it there also is, is set clearly out the back as well. So, so that is a view that officers have taken from visiting the site, from looking at it along the road, um, and from weighing up the issues. So I just wanted to clarify that. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Suzanne. Um, Alderman Kerrigan. Uh, thank you, Chair, for allowing me in. Uh, Chair, I, I, I fully take on board what, what Suzanne has, has stated there, but I, I, to be fair, 
I would be kind of more minded. I know that area very well. It's in the neighbouring town land from my own home place. And, and so I've been on that road very, very often. And the lie of the land, when you come up onto that wee height, and as, as a state there, I would have been more minded that that building at the rear of number nine is uh, as, 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 um, quite visually linked there because it is close to the road and there's a wee bit of a hedge, but just depends what way uh, your, your man has it cut at certain times of the year. So I, I would be minded to, to, to second uh, Councillor McGuire's proposal, Chair. Uh, with with the greatest respect, and I fully take on board Suzanne's advice, but I still am minded to second Suzanne's or Cairn's uh, proposal. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Alderman McC or Alderman Kagan. Um, Councillor McGuire. Uh, again, uh, appreciate uh, Suzanne's uh, intervention. Um, if I could just add, uh, Mr. Ban area plan one. Two three point two point one as well to the uh, to the reason for uh, overturning the uh, recommendations here, the proposal. Okay, thank you, members. Um, is there any further questions? We've got a proposal, and which has been seconded. Um, but as before, I go to a vote. Um, is there any further comments or questions? Chair, it's Suzanne again. Sorry, just if yep. we want to consider conditions, if there's any specific conditions that members uh, feel appropriate to attach. Chair, the, the standard condition, yeah. Okay. So, members, if there's no further comments um, or questions, there's a proposal from Councillor McGuire. Seconded by Alderman Kerrigan, they um, overturn the officer's recommendation and to approve the application subject to standard conditions. As again, um, this uh, uh, this isn't going to be unanimous, so I'm going to ask Mora to take us to the vote. Thank you, Chair. Okay, members, this is item three. Um, there's a proposal to not accept the officer's recommendation to overturn this um, recommendation to um, approve the application in front of us. So, Councillor Barr. Barr. Thank you. Councillor John Boyle. Thanks. Alderman Alan Breslin. Present yet. Sorry, Laura. Councillor Angela Dobbins is sent her apologies. Councillor Paul Gallagher. Four. Thanks, Paul. Councillor Sean Harkin. Abstain. Councillor Christopher Jackson. Four more. Okay. Councillor Dan Kelly. Four. Okay. Alderman Keith Kerrigan. Four, Mara. Okay. Alderman Hilary McClintock. Four, Mara. Thank you. Councillor Keir McGuire. Mora. Yeah. Councillor Philip McKinney. Abstain, Mora. Thank you. Councillor Aileen Mellon. Mora. Sorry, I just missed that, Aileen. Four. Four, thank you. Councillor Sean Mooney. Against. Against, right. So that's eight four, two abstained, and one two again. Sorry, apologies, Chair. I'll do that again. Eight four, two against, and one two abstentions. Okay, thanks, Moira. Um, and that to the I suppose the the same result. And that app that application has been approved. Um, so I'm going to move on now in the next application according to our running order is item number eight in our packs. It's LA 11 2020 1002 and it's Maliki that's going to take us through this. 
You ready, Moggy? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, um, item eight is L11 2020, um, 1002. It's a full application. Um, the application is to rearrange the internal layout of an existing house to accommodate two apartments, one on each floor. Then the location is 38 Glasgow Terrace, Derry, and the recommendation is to refuse. Um, if you can see from the attached location, the, the site is located uh, within an existing residential area characterized by two-story terrace dwellings uh, known as the Glen. Uh, here's an overhead view of the site. Um, in terms of the immediate context of the site, the, on, there's a uh, takeaway to on one side and an existing dwelling on the other side of the property and existing residential properties to the rear. Separated by a muse lane. Um, this is the front elevation of the proposed site, the 38 Plaza Terrace. As you'll see on the left hand side, it was a takeaway um, and then a, a dwell on the dollar side. And again, just to give an idea of the, the character of the area, it's characterized by terrace dwellings, um, two story terrace dwellings, um, fronting on the roadside with no front gardens, usually with a, a yard to the rear. Uh, it's a fairly medium density um, built up area. Again, it's just an art photograph to give you an idea. Again, and the proposed floor plans uh, and the existing floor plans are shown in the slide. The existing floor plan show it was a traditional um, two story dwelling with uh, you know your living room, um, kitchen, and two to three bedrooms um, could be accommodated in existing property. The proposed um, floor plan at ground floor level will have a, a, a kitchen uh, living area, which would have been in the former um, living room. And um, probably in the former kitchen is a proposed bedroom with a, an ensuite toilet and, a, and a, an access to the yard to the rear. Uh, and the first floor, uh, again, we have a, a shared kitchen living area. Um, with a, a bathroom and again another one bedroom on suite. Um, in terms of policy context, um, the, 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 the relevant policy context for this application uh, within the Derry Air Plan is policy H5, H which sets out a, a designated flat zone. Um, a designated flat zone, if you're within that, there's a presumption in favour of conversion. If you're outside the designated flat zone, uh, there's a presumption uh, again, so there's a number of exceptions which we'll touch upon later in terms of policy, which is set out that hit six, which is conversions outside the designated flat zone. Um, the SPPS uh, is relevant as well as PPS free. And again, the other critical policy in this consideration in this application would be PPS seven, and it's uh, addendum in particular, which deals with the safeguard and the character of established residential areas. Um, within that policy, LC2 deals with conversion of change of use of existing buildings or, uh, or flats. Um, we consulted a number of bodies uh, in relation to the application. The FA uh, roads were consulted and have no objections in terms of parking standards and provisions. Um, there will be no discernible difference between what would be required for a single way and what's proposed. And environmental health have come back with standard informatives and you know have highlighted the, that the property is in close proximity to uh, a, a, you know approved takeaway use at 40 Glasgow Terrace. Um, we, one objection that was received from the residents of number 33 Glasgow Terrace. They raised a number of issues, including parking, problems with uh, houses, HMOs. Uh, and apartments and not social behavior in the area uh, and all our issues relation to their health and uh, the association with the proposed use. Um, whilst all these use, all these uh, objections have been given consideration in the case officer's report, it's important to note that none of them were given to determine and wit uh, in the, the final decision and recommendation before you. As was fairly earlier, there's a designated flat zone within the area area plan. Um, this image attached is uh, taken from the area area plan. We'll give you an idea of the, the location. Um, everything within within the red area, 
there is a presumption in favour of uh, conversions uh, subject to the policy. Uh, and if you slide, say, the red area, um, you must uh, take into account policy H6, which says that conversions would not normally be accepted, uh, subject to a number of exceptions. So the site, uh, Glasgow Terrace, um, lies outside, perhaps up here now where the cursor is. Um, so it will be subject to policy H6. Therefore, um, as I says, it will not normally be accepted uh, conversions, um, except where dwelling is considered to be no longer suitable for family, uh, for sorry, for single family accommodation after assessment of factors such as size, age, condition, location, and adjoining land uses. Um, as set out in the report, we've taken all these factors into account. Um, the size is still suitable for single family accommodation. The age of the property is similar in age to other uh, properties in the street, which are still used for this single family uh, accommodation. Um, it appears to be in good enough condition um, to, um, to be used for single family accommodation. Again, in terms of the location and adjoining land uses, it would be uh, in character um, with the, the prevailing um, housing tenure in that area, which is uh, predominantly single family accommodation with uh, some approvals for HMOs too, which we believe are also different in character from flats as proposed. Therefore, it's the officer's uh, opinion that weighing up these factors, um, that it should be retained for that use in accordance with policy H6. <clears throat> um, policy H6 also sets out a further exception uh, in relation to local need. Um, a case has been put forward by the applicant uh, and the evidence has been submitted um, from the Northern Housing Executive to demonstrate that within the city side of Derry that there is a, um, a need for single, uh, single person uh, accommodation um, and therefore NHE have supported you know, that, that aspect of the application but it's also important to note we also support the, the, the retention of the existing use because there's also a need for two to three bedroom dwellings, uh, such as that is already in existence uh, at the property. Um, in addition to that, they're, they're we pressed for evidence in relation to the particular locality um, in terms of the, you know, the Glen Rosemount area, NIHE, NI we're not able to provide us them that detailed information. Um, so, on balance, we believe that there's been no local um, exceptional need demonstrated you know, for this particular type of use um, at the location. Um, which brings us on the policy PPS7, which uh, in general deals with residential environments uh, and links you through to PPS7 addendum. So, there's a number of criteria within QD1. Um, which we have considered ADA and uh, in the main, the proposal would meet these. However, when we consider the application in relation to the addendum PPS7 in terms of safeguard uh, existing residential areas, we took particular cognizance of LC2 uh, in relation to change of use of existing buildings to flats. And in particular, um, with there's criteria C it states that uh, the original property must not be uh, must must be greater than 150 square meters in floor space. Um, number 38 Glasgow Terrace, uh, as submitted um, and the drawing submitted has been measured, and the standard is well below 150 square meters. And um, we've measured a total floor space of uh, approximately 67 square meters. <laughs> Therefore, um, taking into account, you no, know, the end of the PPS seven. We do not believe it meets criteria C, and therefore the property as it exists does not lend itself to this type of change of use from a single well to two apartments, given the, the small size of the property. Um, I think this is a critical consideration I said alongside the, the other consideration from the dairy area plan. Uh, in terms of PPS3, um, we've taken into account a number of factors uh, in terms of location. Of the property and the available of on um, off street parking, 
Uh, but critically in this case is that uh, in terms of road standards and parking standards, there's no uh, discernible difference required in terms of requirements for the, a two year three bedroom house as opposed to two uh, flats at this location. Uh, so therefore, in summary, um, we do not believe the proposal meets the any of the two exceptions that would be uh, relevant um, to this proposal. But, um, we believe that it can be retained as a, a single family accommodation, and we do not believe that there's been uh, exceptional local need has been demonstrated. Um, we must take into account both the dairy plan and PPS seven addendum. So critically in this case, the property is uh, well below the threshold of 150 square meters uh, and, and a set out in the LC2. Uh, therefore, it does not lend itself to the, the proposed change of use. Um, as I say, it has to be both the area plan and PPS 7. And uh, we we'll wait up both uh, policies together um, and on their own, we believe that there's reasons for refusal as set before you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Maggie. Can I invite Liam Nealis to address the committee? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, you five minutes. No problem. Thank you. Uh, good evening or good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Maggie, thanks a million for that. Uh, before I start, I think I would also like to um, thank Maliki and Maura last week for setting up a meeting to have a conversation around this. And I thought that as a process was a very helpful process and in lieu of just going straight on the committee meeting and understanding each other's sides to it. Now I know that that has been reflected in the in the case officer's report. Um, our application is for redevelopment of an existing dilapidated dwelling uh, at 38 Glasgow Terrace in Rosemount. Uh, our client, Purple Door Developments, have a track record of delivering high quality residential developments in and around uh, Northern Ireland and they're particularly focused now more recently in the dairy area. Uh, in dairy and housing terms, we face two major problems. Um, one is a chronic housing shortage, which all of us in this call will be acutely aware of. Um, the Place Shaping North Department of the Northern Ireland Housing Executive confirmed that the social housing need in Derry's West Bank is projected at 2,699 units between 2020 and 2025. Now, whilst the extensive social housing developments throughout the city plan, they try and um, alleviate this problem. There's very little done really in terms of releasing the pressure around the single largest group of people in housing stress in this area, which are singles. Uh, and currently out of that almost 2,700 people, tw over 1,200 of those are the single groups. So whilst they're the biggest group, they're arguably the group that are least catered for, particularly in large scale residential developments where naturally families are the ones that are they're tending to be housed first. The second big problem that we've got in this area, and again, we're all acutely aware of this, is the number of derelict houses uh, in Derry and include, uh, indeed in the north. Um, there have been action plans and strategies developed in the past by the Department for Social Development to tackle this very issue. Um, a large factor on properties not being refurbished in this area uh, are down to them not being financially viable. Uh, simply put, so in this property, the first um, the first job that the client asked us to do was to go on and do a condition survey of it. Now, the condition survey of this revealed that it needed new windows, needed new doors, needed a full new plumbing system, full new heating system, um, full new electrics, full new kitchen redevelopment, bathrooms that needed fully damp proof, um, which made the upgrade for a small family dwelling uh, uneconomical for the developer. Um, now, this proposal renovates the property, but it also creates uh, an economically sensible option for the developer. Um, and this is relatable to the, the condition referred to in policy H6, where it does specifically refer to the building condition being something that can be looked at for approval outside of what can be seen in, in, in policy H6. Um, in the area, and this has been picked up both by Maliki in his, in his uh, conversation there and in the case officer's report, Number seven, Glasgow Terrace has been approved um, in 2019 as a HMO application. Now, uh, this is likely, in my opinion, and this is only an opinion, that the source of the objection, which is on the other side of the street from the, the lady and gentleman, I think it's in number 38, um, 
I would imagine they refer directly to the HMO and flats. Now, there are no other flats that are approved in that area. Um, our applicant uh, is not in the market. They, they build cheap HMO uh, accommodation. They're not here to try and fill houses full of students and, and try and get quick, fast book returns to developments that they're interested in or high end developments where they're trying to create residential amenity and quality of development, which will attract young professionals, which will attract single people, uh, which will attract people who don't automatically qualify for the more larger um, two, three, four bedroom uh, accommodation. Um, I, I've recently heard actually uh, about the Kerala nurses coming to the area and they all come and they stay in the halls while they fin finalize their, um, their qualifications. But ultimately, then when they complete that and they move out and they're working on the field, they can find nowhere to live in Derry because of the chronic shortage of the type of accommodation which we're referring to in this application. Now, with policy H6 and LC2 to the addendum of PPS7, uh, it is acknowledged uh, that we can see the following outcomes. In my view, the client here for me has presented me a couple of options. It may remain derelict, um, or he may come back and he may apply for a HMO. Now, I know if I was living on that street, what I would rather see in the, if, if you put the option to me of dereliction, uh, a HMO, or potentially two high-end apartments. Um, I don't really have any more to say on it. I just think that in this instance, I totally understand the plan policy. I understand the context. And, and as I say, the presentation that was made last week was very clear and concise. I just think that in, in this area particularly, we've got two chronic problems, and both of them almost scream at each other, and neither of them help each other. Um, and I think that in this, there's a, a possibility and an opportunity here to try and create a development that can be a bit, you know, sort of front footed and how we deal with the problems that we've got here. And I'm happy to take any questions on that as well. Thank you, Liam. Members, is there any questions for Mr. Nevis? Alderman McClintock. Thank you, Chair, and thanks, Liam, for your presentation. Um, and I appreciate what you're saying about the condition of the property at the present time, the dilapidated condition it's in. But you also said that um, your client uh, prides himself in providing high quality developments, which is certainly something that we like to hear. And the fact that you mentioned about the windows, the doors, the plumbing, the electrics, all that has to be has to be upgraded. But I suppose we have a duty here to make sure that. Um, quality accommodation as provided. And the one thing that strikes me is under uh, LC2, the recommended size is no less than 150 square meters, but the proposed, um, but this is actually a, a, just a dwelling of 67 square meters. So how does that meet your condition or your client's um, high quality development? I suppose just if you could just clear it up for me. Yeah, well, look, um, the plans that were submitted were one day 100. Our estimations of the area are actually 77 square meters. So we're just short of 40 square meters for one bed accommodation, which in housing association terms is, is adequate. So um, the 100, you have to also probably remember that the 150 square meters is a figure that's set out, not for any reason. It doesn't relate to any, you know, so it doesn't relate the 150 meters can be split on the one, two, three, four, five apartments. Uh, I think the broader scope of the 150 square meters is to try and make sure that the the houses that are being refurbished or that are being transitioned into apartments are the bigger ones that are more commonly associated with being out of use of standard family living now because they're too big. Um, but I also think that by creation of that policy, we're also missing the opportunity just by default because we haven't hit a, a level or a threshold that's dictated in an old plan policy. That we can actually create this really strong uh, development potential in the smaller properties as well. So the size of the two proposed apartments are well within, uh, you know, housing association standards in terms of the quality of living in it for one people uh, apartments, but they don't meet a, a notional threshold. That again, I understand it, you know, and and I understand the policy very well. I just think that that's created more in line with trying to make sure that you only get these big, big, large properties in Derry. Which, to be quite honest, we don't have an awful lot of, particularly in these areas on and around Rosemount, where the you know the, the number of dilapidated properties in this area is, is chronic. It's it's really is chronic. So, um, my view is we have to try and find a balance somewhere on it. Um, and if we can control the quality of what we're providing here, and you know, HMOs for me are are a great asset in certain areas of the city. I'm not particularly uh, inclined to always think that they're great in every area of the city, but. Um, you know, if we look at uh, any residential development nowadays, and in particular with the uh, housing association developments, 
flats or apartments or whatever you want to call them are an integral part of all of those applications. So for me, blending those and all the existing housing stock and dairy, and particularly in and around the houses where we've got a, a large number of dilapidated properties, is a very sensible way to try and create a solution to two problems that we're facing at the same time. Okay, thank you. Liam, Alderman McClintock, are you content with the response? I've heard the response, shall we say that? I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Okay. Um, is there any further questions for Liam? No. Thanks. Uh, uh, Councillor Mellon, apologies. Sorry, Chair. Thank you. Really much. Um, I just wanted to come back to the point um, that was made around um, should this not happen, then it runs a risk of the property lying derelict and the state of disrepair that it was in. Um, first, um, I don't know what maybe the applicant can say if, you know, I'm sure it wasn't a surprise um, of the condition that was in and was probably reflected within the purchasing of the, the building. Um, and secondly, is we're hearing a lot about the housing shortage within our area. Um, surely it's about a Robin Peter to pay Paul taking away housing that is also needed um, for a housing need. So I think that argument takes away itself. Um, I just wonder in terms of the size, um, the housing associations, it's contrary to our, our policy, but if the applicant is saying that it is um, within standard of housing associations, because we can see from the builds that we see today around, particularly the one beds or ground floors, um, what size do they be? Um, I'm sure it's not the small size that we see in this application, but does the applicant know that whenever he's speaking around comparing it, comparing it to the other one? Um, I just wanted to also state that you know, whilst we all are aware, as you said, that um, there is a housing shortage here, we need to ensure that we don't provide substandard housing in the middle of a housing crisis because we'll be left with a legacy of that. And we see that from old ways of working. And I hope that this planning committee um, today remembers that we need to have a high standard of housing for people to actually let not just survive, but thrive in. Um, I just wanted to make that note to the applicant. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sorry, uh, can I respond to that, Councillor? No, no, go ahead, Liam. So, uh, problem so of that, there's no doubt. And, and as I say, that apologies if that looked like it was some kind of failed set. That, that wasn't the case at all. Um, in terms of the development, normally around 37 square metres uh, per floor would be a one person uh, accommodation. This is 38 per, per uh, floor at the moment. So, we sit just above uh, the minimum threshold of that. I totally uh, reflect your. Um, call for what is um you know the, the higher quality of residential developments but again in terms of robin peter and Payne paul um what the housing executive and place shape and north have identified for us is that of those just shy of 2700 people um the largest group is 1200 and three people for singles but they are also the group that are facilitated least and the multitude of housing developments that we're getting across the city which accommodate for all of the others so for example um uh, small families, 689, large families, 102, elderly, 208. So those three criteria are always the ones that are served greatest in the new build developments. But one bed apartments are by virtue of the size of them and, and the scale of them, generally the ones that are serviced less, but that's the one with the highest housing needs. So if we just keep moving forward and we keep uh, providing the ratio of housing that we are and all the social housing schemes, and we're all familiar with all of them in the town at the minute. The reality is that that singles group will continue to get larger, where the rest of them will continue to shrink. And all I'm saying is it's not quite Robin Peter to pay Paul. I think that we do have an onus on us to try and create uh, provision for all of those groups. But what we're talking about here is the largest single group and the group that is growing bigger than any other group, but is probably getting served least by all of the housing developments that have been built throughout the city. Okay. Thanks for that, Liam. And just, I suppose, on the back of your comment, uh, in the absence of any other questions or comments, it would be remiss of us to um, ignore the fact that this committee 
has approved quite a, a substantial um, amount of apartment type accommodation in the city over recent months and, and a lot of them have are, are currently under development and, and nearing completion so um but but in terms of the housing need and and the number of people requiring a type of accommodation it's the point's well made and and i'm sure accepted by the committee but it, it, it would be remiss to say that that's that that's something that's been ignored because this committee would be only too familiar with the large number of apartments um that have been passed um by the committee um are we moving on now to questions of the officers is there anybody else with a question for mr Nilis? i i had a, ch a question chair yeah go ahead concert yeah I, I, i'm not sure if I, I got the same report that's on the screen and my pack because there was images on screen that I don't have in my pack and there was a reference there to it being a, a medium density built up area just as we were looking at a picture of rooftops um, so I think I mean that image was of a, a high density built up area as far as I'm concerned so there's aspects of this application which um, are, are I find okay but then there are there are other aspects like that overhead image also showed a whole number of streets with not a single blade of, of grass. Um, so I know you're talking, Liam, about uh, comparing with housing association standards, but uh, I was struggling when I looked at that to see where was the amenity space because there, there absolutely is none. Um, so I, th I think in terms of the space comparisons, uh, there are other considerations such as amenity. It's not just about what, you know, what size of a bedroom or, or kitchen. Uh, just on the other point then, Chair, is that uh, there was reference made to a shared kitchen, but the plan I have on my pack um, shows two apartments with two kitchens, and I'm just wondering, could I clarify that that is two apartments with two kitchens, not a shared kitchen? Go ahead, Liam. Yeah, uh, just to confirm that that is two single uh, individual apartments with their own individual kitchens, bedroom, bathroom, etc. as well. Okay. Uh, and just can I pick up on the point as well, just in the immediate and I think that's a very good point well made. Um, now, naturally, when we're talking about places like Rosemount and we're talking about places like the Bogside and certain areas of Craigan, you have a natural deficit in the immunity, and I think that's reflective of the plan and policies back in the under whenever all this development was built. But what I would say is within a couple of hundred metres of this site, you have the Craig and Burn Park, um, which is one of the biggest parks uh, in our city parks in, in, the, in the city. So um, in regards to that, I think that there is quite readily available local amenity within a very short walking distance, literally only a three minute walk from the, the application site. Um, and just to pick up on your point, Councillor Jackson, um, apologies, maybe I didn't make that point well. I, I don't for one minute suggest that there aren't any apartment developments being built, but there are no developments being built where the apartments are the prominent development uh, in, in the broader term of the large scale housing developments, whilst the reflective number of people who are in need are those apartments, that's all I'm saying. So there's just a wee bit of a deficit of the requirement against the, the need. Okay, hey, thank you. Um... Is there any further questions from Mr. Nilis? Okay, I'm going to move. Thank you, Liam. I'm going to move on now to questions to officer. Is there any questions from Algi? Councillor Boyle. Thanks, Chair. Actually, I, I wasn't expecting any questions from Maliki, uh, Chair, uh, and I'm, I'm very much all mind to make a proposal here and now. We'll uh, see if you see if you hold it because there's other indicated well, speakers. Can you let me come back to come to make a I'll proposal? Come, I'll come back to you. I'll come back to you for a proposal, Councillor Harga. Have you a question, or do you want to? Are you? I'll have a question for, for Maliki. Yeah, go mm -hmm. ahead. Well, yeah, thanks, Chair, and thanks, Mr. Nealis, for the presentation and being frank about the. About the application too. Um, for Maliki, Maliki, from your perspective, could you throw a bit of light on this issue about the space and housing associations uh, and what the standard is? If you could just bring a wee bit more clarification on that, because that, that would be helpful from, from my point of view. Okay. Um, 
Thanks, Chair. Uh, thanks, Councillor Harkin. Um, well, there's, there's planning policy uh, that we're referring to here in relation to LZ2. Um, that's in terms of floor space of the total building in terms of what's suitable for conversion. When we're talking about space standards for social housing, that's normally applied to you know, a new build um, flats or a property that's suitable for conversion. So there's two different issues here. Um, so on one hand, ALC2 is saying what the the size of the property should be let no in total, where and once you have a property that's acceptable, say for example, that's over 150, then you would have to apply the appropriate standards in for house association, which will be applied uh, um, on, a, on a case by case basis then like no. So yes, whilst this might uh, notably meet those uh, separate requirements, it doesn't meet the planning policy in our opinion. Does that help? Thanks, Thanks. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Is there any further questions from Algi? No. Councillor Boyle, does the question that, that Councillor Harkin asked, does that change your opinion in terms of making a proposal? It actually, it actually does not. In fact, it, it, it supports the proposal I'm, I'm planning to make, Chair. So, am I okay to go? Yeah, yeah, go on ahead. Okay, Chair. Well, based on um, the officer report, uh, based on my extensive knowledge of the neighbourhood, um, uh, and I know that Liam, uh, the agent here, has done much, and he's been very frank and uh, open. And he's done much to try and convince the committee here today, but I'm not convinced, and I regret to say, uh, uh, on this particular occasion. And we have to pay attention to uh, the reasons why we, we shouldn't be convinced. It is outside the designated flat zone. PPS 7 has not been overcome, uh, or indeed uh, policy H6. Uh, you know, it's important to safeguard um, the character of, of these particular types of residential areas. Um, these houses are still, in my view, uh, suitable for single family accommodation. Uh, and I, I, I do support policy H6 in, re in regard to that. These, uh, in truth, um, for want of a better way of putting it, the proposal here is for two tiny flats. Um, uh, and for me, that would be if we move be below the threshold uh, of 150 metres square, for me, that would be the straw that breaks the camel's back. Uh, and where do we stop in relation to that uh, as sort of development? Um, and, and I understand that uh, developers will uh, um, buy uh, properties with a particular view, but it would have been known um, that this is outside, but it should have been known, certain evidence suggested that this was outside uh, the designated flat zone. And I suppose in some senses, there's a, there's a suggestion here that buyer beware. Um, because again, what's being suggested here, with all due respect, uh, are two flats that you, uh, for want of a better way of, way of putting it, you couldn't swing a cat on, as we say. Um, so, you know, based on that, and actually knowing the area as well as I do, it's called Glasgow Terrace for a reason, actually. It's, it's what's in, uh, what we just be referred to as the Scots Quarter. And these houses were built for workers who came over from the Clyde way back in the day to work in the dairy uh, shipyard, which is now where Sainsbury's is. Um, and we all know of, of the size of the type of accommodation that workers like that were uh, expected uh, to work, uh, to, to live in with their families. These are by no means large family accommodations. Um, however, I, I do believe that they're still uh, should be retained uh, for, for families. Um, uh, and so therefore, uh, I'm proposing that we support the officer recommendation to refuse the application. Okay, thank you, Councillor um, Boyle. And I note that um, Councillor Mellon agrees with the points that you made and, and has agreed to second your proposal. Um, Councillor Harger. Yeah, it was just to say, look, I, I agree with Councillor uh, Boyle's proposal. I, I think that uh, Liam has made us aware, uh, and we're already aware of it, about the desperate need for all 
types of uh, housing across the district and, and Rosemount the Glen is no different. And there is a crying need for um, uh, single flats, um, but there's also the issue of the, the quality of those, because if we agree to this now, um, I think that that will then set a precedent that, that would mix it very unhard to, 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 to we, you know, roll back from when the next application comes before us. And then we've got a problem with, with tiny, tiny apartments. Um, and, I, and I think that that's not the way that we want to go. Uh, I think we have to keep pressing for the kind of quality apartments that we that we need that are the right size. I think the residential, uh, you know, that this is it's still a very residential area. Um, I think we want to, uh, you know, I I hope that the applicant will um, do up this house uh, so a family can live in it uh, and and not retreat out of the um, uh, plan to kind of fully renovate it. Uh, but I, I am going to support the uh, officer's recommendation on this one. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Money. Chair, thanks for letting me in. Um, just on a personal note, um, I was born and reared the next street across from the applicants where, where, where the application is. So I know that area very well. I know the houses. I love them exactly the same type of house. And uh, in my view, I think Councillor Boyle and the rest of the speakers have actually um had the right note um they should be you know primarily used for family and i don't think it would be probably suitable for those type of units but that's all i just wanted to say thank you chair thank you um concern money and i suppose just um they have my home voice because um i agree with a lot of what um Mr. Nealis had said in, in terms of his presentation, and there is um, some parts of our city where there is there's a high housing need, and then there, and there's also um, high levels of empty properties, and that's and, and that is something um, as a council, as a committee, that, that we should be working to address, and we are working to address it. Um, I would I would have very strong concerns that um, that reduction of standard is some uh, that, that is that that if that's even been considered as a, a route to try and address our housing crisis and, and the housing need in our city, um, it, it would be it, it would be completely against um, the direction of travel that this committee has been going on um, in the time that I've been on it. So. Um, I would agree with the sentiments. Um, I wholeheartedly agree with the sentiments that um, our ours have made in terms of their reluctance to consider reducing standards, um, accepting a reduction of standards as a way of trying to tackle their election. Um, members, if there's no further questions, there is um, there's a proposal from Councillor Boyle. Seconded by Councillor Mellon, they accept the recommendation to refuse. I'm going to put that to vote. Is there anybody, I've, everybody I've heard speaking has agreed with that um, proposal? Is there anybody with a contrary view? Yeah, members, I'm going to take that as unanimous. So that application has been refused. Members, um, we have reached, we've Went beyond the two hour mark. I'm going to propose we take a 10 minute comfort break. So it's six minutes past four now. I'm going to reconvene the meeting at um, 16 minutes past four. So I'll see you, I'll see you on back then.
Okay, members. We can everybody ready to resume the meeting. Our next application is Appendix Nine. It's LA eleven twenty twenty zero five 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 F, and it's um, Andre that's going to take us through it. Andre, you ready? Yeah, thank you, members. Um, this is item nine, LA 11 2020 0555F, and the proposal is for the development of a new school for Ardnashee School and College with associated playgrounds, ball courts, car parking, landscaping, and site works. And the location is 122 Northland Road, London Dairy, BT 480AW, and the recommendation is to approve. So, members, the site comprises the former former Foyle College Junior School and Associated Playing Fields and Parking Area. The former school was seriously fire damaged in July 2018 and was subsequently demolished. Therefore, currently there are no buildings on the site. The site is zoned as existing open space in the dairy area plan, which is the case for all school sites in the city. There have been no intervening uses on the site since the previous school was used. The site is surrounded on all sides by residential development and the Northland Road is to the northeast of the site where access to the new school is proposed from the existing entrance. The existing St Mary's College is located to the east on the opposite side of Northland Road. This is an aerial view of the site taken recently. The hard stand of where the Foyle College building stood is visible, as is the adjacent parking area and associated playing fields. These slides show recent photographs of the site. These photographs are taken from the Northland Road and show the entrance to the site, which will be utilised for the new Ardnashe School. And these photographs members show an internal view of the site and of the existing avenue used to access the Foyle College and will be used for the, the new school also. This slide shows the proposed footprint of the new school. Northland Road runs along the bottom of the plan and the access is proposed off the existing access point and avenue. The new school has a larger footprint than the old Foyle College School due to its necessary design requirements to provide for a single storey building, providing for suitable educational facilities to meet the curricular needs of 340 pupils with special educational needs. There is car parking to the front of the building and an area for bus circulation and drop off pick up, pick up facilities. All traffic circulation will be to the front of the school building and the rest of the site will be utilised for play areas and extensive landscaping. The proposed school building is single storey, designed in line with the applicant's requirements. The scale, massing and design are appropriate to the character and topography of the site. Officers consider the design as attractive and functional. The main materials to be used include clay facing brick, colour cladding panels, glazing and render finish. The top elevation is that which faces onto Northland Road and the bottom elevation on the slide here faces towards Glenbank Road. These are the proposed elevations towards Lintonwood Park and Hatmore Park and due to the manipulation of levels on the site and the low elevation of the proposed building, there will be limited views of the school from the surrounding residential properties. And this slide shows proposed elevations of the sections of the school building from the internal courtyard. So these 3D visuals uh, members were submitted by the agent during the processing of the application and show the new school building set within the context of the site. And these are just further 3D visuals of the building and the internal courtyard. And as stated earlier, the applicant is proposing to alter the existing levels on the site to effectively lower and create a level surface area to provide for the school building and its immediate facilities. The land will be sensitively graded and landscaped to the north and west to provide an attractive environment. And this is just showing further sections showing the school building set into the site. So members, the following consultees were consulted during the processing of the application. 
uh, DFI Roads, NI Water, Environmental Health, Historic Environment Division, NIEA Water Management Unit, Regulation Unit, Natural Environment Division, Shared Environmental Services, Locks Agency, and DFI Rivers. And they all had no objections subject to conditions and informatives. And also members, no representations were received during the processing of the application. So as set out in detail in the planning report, the application has been assessed against the Dairy Area Plan 2011 and the following relevant policies, the SPPS, PPS2, PPS3, PPS6, PPS8 and PPS15. And officers consider that the proposed development is in accordance with relevant planning policy. So in conclusion, officers consider that the proposal is considered acceptable and that it is in accordance with the Dairy Area Plan 2011 and all other material considerations. The principal of a school on the site is acceptable as it was previously a school, Boyle College Junior School on the site. The site is considered to be a brownfield site and there has been no intervening use of the land. The site has been vacant for a number of years and this proposal will bring a vacant site back into use. Uh, planning policy and all other material considerations have also been taken into account um, and support and approval of the application subject to conditions as set out in the planning report. Officers there, therefore recommend that the application is approved subject to the conditions as set out in your planning report. Thank you, members. Okay. Thank you, Andre. Um, can I invite Claire Ogle and Abigail McConville to address the committee? Hello, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Committee, for allowing me to speak. Um, my name is Claire Ogle, and I'm representing the agent Samuel Stevenson's. Um, at this point, I, I need to apologise for Abigail McConville, um, who was representing the client, the Education Authority. Unfortunately, she's been unable to, to access um, the meeting via the EA IT system, so I'll be representing um, any sort of questions on her behalf as well. Um, at this time, I, I don't want to wish to make any further uh, representations, um, but I'm very happy to take any questions from committee members. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you, Claire. Um, is there any questions for Claire members? No. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to move on now to questions. Councillor Boy, have you a question? Just one brief question for, for Claire. Um, uh, and Claire, thanks for taking the time to come along and to provide us with the opportunity. I, I don't know if I missed it, Claire, so forgive me. Uh, forgive, forgive me. I ask forgiveness from our officers as well. Um, what's the expected time frame for uh, this particular project? To completion, I suppose, is the question. Um, procurement for the contractors has actually commenced, and um, EA are anticipating that will be on site in late autumn of this year. With the completion date of potentially. Completion date is two years after that date. I need to check. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, Councillor McKinney. This is really more of an interest question. The um, pitches across the road from the actual old site, are, are they included in, in, in this um, project? Um, are these are these the pitches on the other side of the of the of the of Northlands Road? If, if sure, it is, sure, that, I, yes, sorry, I should have said that. Sorry, yes. No, no, it's not. That doesn't form part of the site. And just to clarify as well, um, it's a thirty-month contract from um, commencement on site. And the pitches opposite aren't owned by EA. <laughs> okay, um, members, is there any questions? For Claire, any further questions? Councillor Mellon? Sorry, Chair. Um, I have no 
questions for the applicant. I'll wait until after questions for the officers. I would like to make a proposal, but I'll wait. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, is there any questions for the applicant or the agent? No. Thank you, Claire. Um, I really appreciate uh, appreciate you waiting uh, and um, appreciate your patience on it. And um, I suppose that no, we'll leave it at that. We'll move on to the questions to the officer. And I know um, Councillor Mellon has indicated she wishes to make a proposal. But before I come to Aileen, is there any questions um, for Andre? No. No questions. Um, bring Councillor Mellon in. Yeah, thank you, Chair. And um, it was just so, two seconds, Aileen. Um, Councillor Boyle, have you a question for Andre? No, better on. Go ahead. Okay. Um, oh, Councillor Mellon, go on ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, it was just to say how delighted I am to see this applicant come before committee today. I know it's been a long time coming. I'm um, speaking to the staff in Ardnishy. They have been waiting a long time as is the students. Um, I think we can all agree here Ardnishy School and College is a great asset to this city and to our children, young people. And I'm glad now that we can see an environment that will be built around it, that'll meet the needs of the young people where they can thrive in their environment that they're in. Um, I know Ardnishy School and College creates a space that is catered to each student. And I would like to think, and I do know within the plans that there is the amenities there so that it can have a holistic approach to learning. Um, it's great to see schools being built, new schools being built in this way that it takes in that holistic approach to learning. Um, and I just want to commend everyone involved for, for getting it to this stage. I look forward to seeing the building and the completion of it where our children and young people again will thrive. Um, I know it's a school for special educational needs, but that's not uh, a, a first thought whenever it comes to Art Machine School and College. It's the, the inclusion they have with the community, their family outreach. The things that they they provide within it, it's, it really is a family and it's a community within the school. They definitely um, are well placed um, within Racecourse Road. We'll be sad to see them going out of uh, our local area, but we'll be delighted to to go and visit them on the Northern Road, where I'm sure we'll see a state of the art provision. Um, nothing short of what our children and young people deserve. So again, Chair, I'm happy to propose the application. Delighted that it's here today and. I'm sure everyone will agree that um, it's time to guess you're, you're glad to see a, a plan and application come, no matter how long or short it comes, it's, it brightens up our day. So thank you again. I, I would I would concur and I, I suppose it is very rare whenever you're reading their planning papers and an application um, brings a smile to your face. And this is certainly one um, that, that did to me when I was reading the report. So I, I get exactly where you're coming from, Councillor Mellon. Um, and I note that in the chat box, Alderman McClantic has indicated that she's second, seconded that proposal. Um, Councillor Boyle. Could, could I speak to it, uh, yeah, Chair? Oh, yeah, 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 you can, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. It, just, it gives me absolutely great, great pleasure to second this because I was a member of staff in Arden and I uh, just believe it's about 20 years, and 20 years ago. And it uh, even then, the 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 whole idea of moving to a new campus was being muted. In fact, there had been disappointment after disappointment. So I really was thrilled, as you said, just to read this application when it came before us. I kept thinking, I hope there's nothing here to object to. I mean, just Ardnishy School is and was the heart of the community. And it's so sad to see them having to leave Racecourse Road, but um, it obviously did no longer uh, fulfill the needs, the specific needs that they had. And I think it's brilliant to see that a vacant school site, when we see so many school sites lying empty, it's it's great to see a, a vacant school site being brought into life. And I think that um, the design of it, obviously because of the the specific needs of the pupils, 
Um, I think that the, the size of the site is just absolutely fantastic to see it uh, going there. And I know those aren't particularly planning reasons, but at the same time, I'm just so absolutely thrilled to have a chance to speak on this and to welcome this application, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, um, Councillor Boyle. Thanks, Chair. Uh, well, um, evidently, I'm not going to say anything that counters what what's, what uh, our two colleagues have, have just said in relation to this application. Um, it's been very, very well prepared. Um, uh, maybe it's been a little while in the coming, but it, but it's here now, and I think it's you know it is a day for celebration. Um, uh, I don't expect anyone on this committee is going to oppose this, and actually, I do believe that it is fitting um, that. Um, uh, Alderman McClintock is one of those who's proposing it because she is a former member of staff of, of the school. Um, just to say and very briefly, Chair, you know, it, it's going to provide a wonderful opportunity to develop a bespoke school campus, an environment that would be conducive to providing educational and indeed recreational opportunities for young people of all ages, and particularly young people with sometimes severe or, or, or moderate uh, learning challenges, uh, as, as I sometimes prefer to call it. Um, I, I only live around the corner from it myself. I'm delighted to see the site was retained by EA, the Education Authority, for this for this uh, particular campus. And I look forward to the day to seeing um, the first cranes coming on site, the first foundations being laid, and of course, after that 30 month period, to see the, the children uh, coming into their new school. I can only imagine how excited um, the, the, the the staff and pupils of the school will be on that glorious day arrives. Just on the on the basis of one question, actually, that um, Councillor McKinney asked, it's my understanding that the, the the rugby and cricket pitch across the across the road, across the Northland Road, um, I, I believe the um, the university may well have acquired that land. I could stand corrected, but I think they did, um, and hopefully we'll see them develop something that may well have be as of value to the school across the street. So um, who knows? But this 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 is certainly one of what I hope and expect to be many uh, days of celebration for uh, our Nishi School. So again, thank you to the officers uh, for providing the report, um, uh, and I wish you all associated with the school uh, the very all the very best with the uh, continued development of, of what is an exciting opportunity for our young people. Thank, thank you, Councillor Boyle. Um, Councillor Hergen. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, I just wanted to um, add that uh, this is a proposal that and an application that uh, I'll be very happy to support today as well uh, for a couple of reasons. One, I mean, Arden Chi School plays such an important role, um, you know, in the city and in the district for, for many, many years. And this is uh, a great site and it's a fantastic um, design and <clears throat> it, 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 it's, it's what uh, the students and the educators there deserve. And I think people across the district will be very, very excited to see this moving forward. Um, so that's very welcome. And I think, uh, you know, it's great to be able to support it. The second one is uh, the FOIL, former FOIL school site. I mean, it, 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 this is a great initiative here um, in terms of the, the, the building plans. And it's good that this site is being, uh, you know, <laughs> Uh, taken advantage of relatively quickly rather than sitting there empty for a long, long period. So for all these reasons, I think that this is, uh, you know, something that we, we I, I, I imagine everybody will be back on this today, but I just want to add uh, our, my uh, support for it. And, and uh, that's that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hargan. Um, on that vote, on that note, um, I do. Um, I'm assuming that this is going to be unanimous, but it's always dangerous in a planning committee to assume anything. Um, so um, I'm going to, uh, before I go to a vote, I'm going to give people an opportunity. Is there anybody else wishes to speak or ask any questions? So we've got a proposal from Councillor Mellon, seconded by Alderman McClintock, um, to accept the officer's recommendation to approve. Um, and if there's no nobody opposed to that, I'm going to take that as unanimous. Yeah, there doesn't there doesn't seem to be any opposition, so I'm going to take that 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 has been unanimous and that application has been approved. 
um, I'm delighted they they stay. So um moving back now, members, um the next application on our list is Appendix Four. It's LA eleven twenty twenty zero one one three. It's an outline application and it's Suzanne. It's going to take us through it. Thank you, Chair. Go on ahead. Okay, uh, members, this is an outline application for a replacement dwelling, uh, 30 metres east of and adjacent to 50 Wood End Road, Valley Magori, and the recommendation is to refuse. And first slide here, members, shows the location map submitted with the application. Um, you can see the part of the building here in green. Um, and the site outline, and this is just an overhead satellite overhead of the of the site layout. This is just a photograph from the side of the road. Just this is the structure proposed to be replaced. And this the dwelling there in the picture is 50 Wood End Road. So in terms of the policy as listed in your packs, members, this is a rural replacement. So we've got the Straban area plan and then obviously PPS 21. Um, and policy CTY3 specifically refers to replacement dwellings. The consultations you'll see from your PACs, um, other than um, Natural Environment Division of, of NIA, all the consultees were satisfied. Um, NIA did have concerns that um, there was no preliminary ecological assessment had been submitted because a number of species, priority species, have been identified on the site. Um, but I will cover that later in the presentation. In terms of the policy context, then CTY3, um, you will have gathered through the report that this structure was previously replaced back in the late 80s um, for the dwelling that's that is now constructed on site, and that is number 50 Wood End Road. So this structure, um, it's a small um, stone, obviously, uh, building. Um, and was replaced um, back in the late 80s. This is the original um, maps that were submitted at the time. So here we have the structure outlined in green, and then here we have again at the reserve matters, the structure, and then the new the footprint of the new um, single story, which was, which was built. So CTY3 actually advises that if a building has been, uh, or a former building has been previously replaced, um, it cannot be eligible for replacement again under CTY3. Subsequent to the approval in early 2000, J2002, there was an application made again to replace um, part of part of the structure. Um, and you'll see that from the details in your packs that this was refused uh, before because the structure had previously benefited. It was previously replaced before this site outline here. Um, there's a structure and it's in, it's in blue there, but that, that is actually the red line of the application at the time. Then in um, 2010, we had another uh, planning application to replace part of the structure again. Uh, this was at the time, this was actually assessed under PPS 21 um, and this uh, was refused on the same uh, principle that it, the structure had already been replaced um, and it actually went to plan the plan appeal as well. And at that time, it was uh, considered that there was insufficient evidence to demonstrate that there was ever two dwellings. So really where we are at the moment in terms of what has changed is we have have we have another letter in from um, a person who advises they used to live in the property when it was two properties. This evidence was provided as well as part of the 2010 application and the planning appeal. Um, so there's there's no change in evidence there. We've asked for any other evidence, which which we haven't been able to get our hands on. So officers are are content that the, the proposal doesn't make CTY3 and it's not eligible for replacement. In terms of integration, we've assessed that because the roadside hedge would have to completely go for visibility displays that there would be an issue with integration there now on the site and it would be quite open and we've got concerns uh, that it doesn't meet CTY 13 as well. 
The other issue which is now um, relevant is to do with the natural heritage and the biodiversity assessment. Um, and you'll probably be aware now, members, that most applications do require a biodiversity checklist. That, depending on the outcome of that, it may require a preliminary ecological assessment. So in this case here, um, we had liaised with the agent. We eventually got um, about three biodiversity checklists. Um, I think the first one wasn't uh, completed by a suitably qualified person. Um, then we went back to the agent to advise. So that the last biodiversity checklist did actually um, advise that there were possibly species, priority species and habitats on the site that would need further assessment. And normally what would follow then is that the agent would submit a preliminary ecological assessment. In this case here, we've asked for it to be submitted. Nothing has come in. So there's insufficient information really to demonstrate that there'll be no impact. And I think the main issue here is really obviously bats, um, given the, the old structure. And NED have actually commented as well that there is some evidence of um, newts on wetlands adjacent to the site which would require to be further surveyed and also um, some priority hedgerows that would need to be, just be considered further in, in any ecological assessment. So without that information, members, we're, we're unable to conclude this satisfactorily under PPS2. So in terms of the proposal then, obviously, um, in summary, really, it, it has already been granted approve or previous replacement. We're unable to grant another um, replacement on the site um, because of the um, lack of integration. The site will be, be quite open, uh, and we're not able. We've got insufficient evidence to prove that you know there'll be no harm to any protected species. Um, so, in summary, then members um, officers should recommend refusal um, for the reasons highlighted here and also in your packs. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Members, there's no. Um... There's no requested speakers for this, so I'm heading straight on the questions to officers. Um, is there any questions for Suzanne? Chair, I have a question. Yeah, Councillor Kelly. Thanks. It's, um, my question is really in relation to the uh, evidence that's required to substantiate any claims in terms of it being uh, two dwellings previously. Um, and I note like the, the report states that the appeal, the PAC found uh, that sort of um, aspect of it determining, but the, from a planning officer perspective, um, they haven't really given credence or weight to the, the claim that from the, the former resident up until 1956, that there was two families there um, Andersons and Devines. So I'm just wondering what what is the policy standard in terms of establishing, um, you know, the credibility of any claim that a structure was two houses rather than than one. Okay, thanks, Councillor Kelly, for the question. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, on inspection of the site, um, the officer is quite clear that there's nothing on the ground that would indicate that it was ever two dwellings. I know in the past we have received photographs of of people outside. You know, it's, you know the you know the old sort of um, structures, whether it's one or two dwellings at the time, to prove that that it was actually a dwelling. But unfortunately, we're not able to have any sort of um, substantial evidence in that. You know, coming forward out of that today, so. I'd be reluctant that we would be relying solely on, um, you know, a, a view. I mean, I, I'm not dismissing that, but I think we need to have clear evidential context here, given the history and given the, you know, given the structure itself, whether it was one or two was originally replaced. OK, so um, I think that's that's important. That's an important consideration as well. And we have that clear evidence um, that 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 was the intentions back in back in that time in 1986 and 1988 to replace that, that complete structure. Okay, does that answer your question, Councillor Kelly? It, it does after a fashion, thanks Chair, yeah. yeah. Thank you, is there any further questions?
No. Members, there's there's a recommendation in front of us, um, which Suzanne has outlined. Is there any thoughts on the recommendation? Can I just come in with a query? Yeah. Uh, my my, I'm just wondering has has that been communicated to the agent of the applicant that, in terms of the evidential base required in terms of establishing, you know, have they been told uh, what what is required for them to get uh, that over the line? And I suppose the follow up question that is is maybe more speculative is if that had happened, would that have changed, um, that aspect of the consideration of the application? Um, yes, Councillor Kelly, the, the, the request has been communicated quite extensively to the agent. Um, there's a very large file sitting beside me here. Lots of requests in terms of all the information that's outstanding. Um, I think it's something that we could only look at. You know, I, I can't give a blanket. Yes, we definitely approve it if we got that because that is not the only issue here at the moment today. Um, so I think we'd have to look at that very carefully and, and what to what extent that is. Um, so I can't, you know, I'm not able to give you a straight yes or no on that. Um, but be be reassured that we have communicated extensively with the agent on this to try to get to try to get information in, and we've been unable to. And, and finally, chair, just in terms of uh, the reference in the report to a previous um, demolition condition. Is that condition, uh, I suppose maybe it's beyond uh, the enforceable time period now, but uh, given what you're saying in relation to the um, protected species or the priority species, is that, um, is that um, condition now effectively being waived? That condition, Councillor Kelly, would be immune from enforcement now. Um, but we would be, you know, just because it would be immune from enforcement wouldn't mean that we wouldn't consider it's appropriate to ask for the issues under PPS2. I mean, there's nothing stopping anybody um, taking a roof off or whatever without any notification to the planning department. So we're just looking at the facts of the case when we're dealing with it and applying the policy appropriately. Um, so that's why we'd be asking it to be considered. Yeah, I think it's, yeah, it's there's an element of eyesore about it, and I think it would have been better one way or another maybe to have something happen on that site, just given that it is now within uh, the reintroduced green belt zone, I suppose, uh, that it's um, it's just it's just it's unsightly. Uh, and I'll just make that comment. Thanks, Chair. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Kelly. Um, Councillor Gallagher, did you wish to make a comment? Chair, no, but I, uh, I, I'll come on now. You brought us in, Chair. I, I, I would agree with Councillor Kelly. Like, I, I, I know this is a, a, a difficult one, but it is a bad looking eyesore that I, um, you know, and I'm, I'm, I, as a planning committee, we're actually saying that's the way it's going to remain. You know, so I, I find it very difficult that if there was some regeneration going on it. That was upgrading it. I think that we should try and and make that as well. You know. Thank you, um, Councillor McKinney. Yes, uh, Chair. I was just going to propose we accept uh, Susan's recommendation. Okay, um, Alderman Kerrigan. Chair, I, I'm going to kind of maybe break the norm here and and second. Uh, Suzanne's uh, recommendation. I'm usually going against it, unfortunately, it just happens to be. But uh, I see what they're trying to do with the application, but I just don't see that it's it's it's, it's going. And as Suzanne stated, she's she's let the applicant know and the agent know that if the evidence can be provided that it was two dwellings, there's a potential of a different outcome. But I I don't see it. I don't see being able to get a, uh, the movement on it to, uh, at present. So I, I'm content to second uh, Councillor McKinney's proposal. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, Alderman Kerrigan. So members, we have a proposal from Councillor McKinney, seconded by Alderman Kerrigan. They accept the recommendation, they refuse. Um, is there any 
anybody else wishes to speak before I take out the vote? No. I'm going to draw it again. Um, Councillor McKinney has proposed that we accept the officer's recommendation to refuse, which is seconded by Alderman Kerrigan. Is there anyone in opposition to that? Yeah. Um, and I see there's opposition to that, so I'm going to hand over to Maura and ask her to take us to a vote. Okay, Chair. So this is item four. The proposal is to accept the officer's recommendation to refuse the application. Councillor Jason Barr. Against, Maura. Councillor John Boyle. Sorry, I just missed that, Councillor Boyle. Four, Maura. Thank you. Alderman Alan Breslin. Sorry, we haven't got him, Mara. Sorry. Still not here. Okay, just double checking. Councillor Angel Dobbins is not here. Councillor Paul Gallagher. Councillor Gallagher. Abstain, Mara. Got that, thanks. Councillor Sean Harkin. Abstain. Thanks. Councillor Christopher Jackson. I'm against, Mara. Councillor Dan Kelly. Against Mora. Alderman Keith Kerrigan. For Mora. Thank you. Alderman Hilary McClintock. For Mora. Thank you. Councillor Kieran Maguire. Councillor Maguire. I'll just come back. Councillor Fault McKinney. Four, please. Sorry, just double check. Was that four, Fault McKinney? It was indeed more four. Yeah, please. sorry, I'm just not catching the start of your. Councillor Aileen Mellon. Councillor Mellon. I'll come back. Councillor Sean Mooney. Four more. Thank you. So I'll just go back again to Councillor Kieran Maguire. I'm not getting anything there, Chair. And Councillor Aileen Mellon. Abstain, Mara. Right. Okay. Chair, do you want me to proceed to talk that up without? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, Chair, that's five, four, three against, and three abstentions. Okay, thank you, Maya. Thanks, members. So that application has been refused. I'm going to move on now to item number five, which is LA 11 It's a list of building consent application. Um, and it's Maggie who's going to take us through that. Over to you, Maggie. Yep. Thank you, Chair. Just bear with me trying to get this chair out here from it. So Apologies for the delay, members. Um, item five is L11 2018 LDC. Uh, and the, the proposal is an alterations and extension of former military building to provide bar, restaurant, landscaping, and associated works. And that's at building 40 at Everington. Uh, and the recommendation is to approve. Um, at this point as well, I would also bring to your attention there is a separate item. 
uh, item nine um, after the applications where DFI are dealing with uh, an application for the same proposal uh, on the reserve matters application. Uh, and a notice of opinion to approve has been, uh, as there's a paper before you to consider after this also. Um, so the application site is uh, within the, the Everton complex. Uh, it's known as Building 40. Um, it's located at the edge there towards the river, uh, back onto Browning Drive, and it's close to the, the Starford Wall um, um, and the Peace Bridge. So as we just come through the, the entrance to the Starford Wall, will be the building to the left hand side immediately. So uh, the Bolden's 40 here, as you see, this will probably be familiar with the image on the left hand side. Um, it's an existing, it's a B2 listed building. Um, it's two storey at one level, split level down into three storey with a basement and an archway that leads through to uh, a courtyard, which is enclosed by a wall uh, which separates it from Browning Drive also. Uh, and you'll see in the right hand image, it's a, an older photograph, which would have been in the pack as well, which shows a, a previous extension um, that would have been uh, on building for at the time the transfer of Everton. This is uh, subsequently being demolished. Um, so the, the existing layout, I mean, it's shown here in this image, it's, again, it just give an idea that it's a split level building, you know, it's, it's covered, it goes, it goes from a basement right up there, you know, with two further stories above, like, so it's three stories at some point, two stories at all, is it? No. Um, Again, it was known as the, the Fisher building. It was a former canteen, uh, and, and it's, a, it's a B2 graded listed building. Um, the proposed images show the, the side elevations. The, the top image will give you an idea. There's basically two elements to the application. There's the extension to the rear of the property. Then there's the, the, the internal um, alterations to provide, you know, the, the upgrade to provide the bar and restaurant. So the extension to the rear, uh, it, it's uh, it steps down. It's really a, a free story uh, at, at at its highest level, uh, and down into the courtyard, it um, steps out a two story, and then down to a, a single story extension. Um, probably the bottom image will probably give you a, a view of the the site looking from the the west bank of the city. Um, as you'll see, there the existing Starfort wall encloses uh, the the site. And much of the ground floor of the proposed extension will be screened from public view uh, over sort of long range and medium views from across the river. Um, the proposed basement floor, um, so I suppose we'll talk about the extension first. The extension is this, this area here. That's uh, predominantly that they provide a bar and restaurant. Uh, and on the plan as well, you'll see that there's an existing Block uh, bald at the back, which is uh, probably a store. Previously used as a store, so it proposes there'll be a toilet block and converted. Um, and then internally at uh, the basement floor level, it's proposed that uh, there'll be a bar restaurant with access out in the existing cobbled courtyard, um, which will be um, enclosed with uh, with um, sensitive use of materials as well. You know, which will be which have been approved by HED. Uh, and the existing stairwell will be used to get down to the basement level. And again, the left, there'll be a new left added to the bottom. Um, again, so we go to ground floor level, you'll see that the extension at the back, you know, it gets a little bit smaller. Um, again, it's to provide bar and restaurant space uh, and some toilet space. Uh, and then within the actual building itself, uh, it'll be mainly bar restaurant um, space as well. Like, you know, and then the, the the remaining floor would be the, the first floor level where the stairwell again will come up in the kitchen area and again the left will the new left will come up here and again you'll see the extension gets much smaller as it gets up to that higher level and again it's uh steps up to a very small area to provide additional bar restaurant area like you no know, um Again, looking from the outside, if you're looking from the front elevation, probably the, the elevation that most people would be familiar with, there is not, there's not a lot of change that no, uh, no to, to the eye, more from the side and back. You can see the extension, you can see the step effect on the left hand side. 
So it's highest level uh, up here and it steps down to a two-story extension and down into a single-story extension. Um, in terms of the materials used uh, for the proposed uh, extension, um, it will be modern materials, um, you know, which will, will be a little bit different from what's uh, used in the existing building. But it'll be uh, an aluminium frame with glazing uh, and painted large panels. Um, so the application before us is a list of building consent. Um, so the only policy matters before us uh, for consideration relate to uh, the alterations to the list of building uh, and um, extensions to the list of building and the proposed change of use to the list of building. So the, the policy context is set out in the area plan with the relevant policies within their BE1 urban design and BE2 list of buildings. Uh, and PPS 6 uh, deals with um, the setting of a list of building and the extension of a list of building in paragraph 6.12 and 6.13. Uh, and PPS 6 is our main policy consideration in terms of the retained regional policy context. Uh, and the relevant policies within that are BH8 uh, in relation to extension and alteration of a list of building uh, and development that may affect the setting of a list of building. So just to uh, clarify, the only issues before us here is the, the, the extension to the list of building and the effect of the list of building. Um, all our matters are dealt with in the reserve matters application. So in list of building applications, our principal consultee is the Historic uh, Environment Division. Um, the applicant has worked closely um, with Historic Environment Division and arriving at our final proposal here. Um, there has been amendments to the application subject to meetings and uh, you know, on site uh, and discussions offline as well. You know. So these have been largely resolved. Uh, they mainly, re mainly retain to the, the internal layouts and proposed changes to the stairwell. It was originally proposed that it would be the original stairwell would be removed to a different location to provide uh, circulation within the building. Um, HED um, consulted with the, the applicant and with, as a result, the stairwell has been retained in its existing position. Uh, the lift has been moved. Um, there's been reconfiguration of the floor space uh, and there's been some amendments to written to our consultee responses. So um, HED have now um, provided you no know, final um, consultation response relation to it and they're happy that the, the extension and any internal alterations um, are compliant with BH8 and BH12. Um, again, the, it is from the context of the Star Fort Wall, but you know, the impact on that will be dealt with under the reserve matters application. So uh, all in all, the, the application meets the, the policy requirement uh, and on bonds, uh, we recommend that list of bond consent is uh, granted you know, um, for Bolden 40 and for the proposal in front of you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Maggie. Um, members, any questions, comments in respect to this list of building consent? I know the reserve matters application um, is outside of the, the remit of this council, but um, it is referred to an item nine. In today's agenda, um, is there anybody wishes to comment or have a question for Maliki? No. I know we've we've got a recommendation to approve, and it has been in consultation with HED, and I know um, that. That's a very positive development in our shells because um, I know in the past, in terms of some of our historic buildings within our city, um, we've we, we've come up against some obstacles with HED, and this is one that I'm, I'm, I'm it's very encouraging to see that HED are are satisfied and and happy with the with the, with the development that's put in front of us. So the modernisation of 
one of our listed buildings, which respects the historic fabric. I think that's a, it's a very positive step, and hopefully we see a lot more of that. I just seen in the chat box that Councillor Boyd has proposed that we accept the officer's recommendation to approve, and Councillor Mellon has, has indicated she's happy to second it. Is there anybody who wishes to comment further? No. Um, so Sir, can I say just uh, just a um, come on and just agree with your comments? Uh, okay. what you say, indeed, it's a it's another proposal that is um, uh, going to mutually benefit the, the site of Everton and and bring it on. And uh, like it's just be associated with your comments in relation to everybody else. And just to thank you, Malagi, for his report. Okay, thank you. Um, now before we. I'm going to head on to a vote now if there's nobody else that wishes to speak. So we've got a proposal um, from Councillor Boyle, seconded by Councillor Mellon, they accept the recommendation they approve. Um, is everybody in agreement? Is there any opposition to that? I'm going to take that as unanimous members. Um, and again, just picking up on the comments from Councillor Mooney, it is a very positive step um, in terms of the modernization of a historic building, um, but but also um, see when we look at at the overall um, the overall use of the building. No, this is for a bar and restaurant, and and hopefully we're moving towards um, a time whenever bars and restaurants are going to generate and benefit from increased footfall within our city centre, and it's very much in keeping with. Our vision um, that we see for um, Edmonton Square to become incorporated as part of our city centre. So this is it's going to be a key element to that, and it's one that I think is very exciting. Um, so it's it's it, it's another positive that's coming from today's meeting. I'm going to move on now to item six and item seven, which um, are related to the same building. So. Um, I'm going to ask Malachi to present them both together, um, but at the end, I'm going to ask members to be mindful that they're two separate applications, which will require two separate proposals and two separate votes. So I'm going to hand over to Malachi. Go on ahead. Malachi, you're on mute. Sorry, apologies. Um, sorry, um, just to clarify in relation to item six and seven, it's not the same building it, it, as the previous item. It's building 63. It's a separate building within Everton Square. Um, it's items six and seven are L11-2021-0269 and L11-2021-0095. Uh, and it's the application is a removal of existing rear extension due to structural uh, instability and rebuilding of the same to match dimensions and aesthetic appearance. And the application site is building 63 Everton Square and the recommendation to approve. Thank you, Maggie. My, my apologies. It was I was referring to that item six and seven were um, in relation to the same building. That's why. Oh, sorry. <laughs> The, the, that's why they were presented together. Sorry, Paul, I picked you up wrong, Chair. Sorry. Um, so the application site is, uh, is again, it's within Everington Square. It's located, um, as you've seen in the attached images, um, you're probably familiar with the, 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 the clock tower building, and then there's building to the left side at the corner um, with the, the steps going up from it. Like, no, it's the corner site opposite the, the cafe there. So the, the, here's an attached image which you may, you may be more familiar with. It's, I guess, currently current, curtained over because there's remedial works being done to the site. But it's a, quite a prominent uh, building at the corner site of Edmonton, and it's been subject to previous uh, approvals. Uh, and you may be familiar with the, the hotel application, which is approved, so it, it forms part of that application site. 
Um, so the, the existing elevations here, um, the, the application relates principally just to this proposed this small extension to the rear, um, which needs replaced because of instability issues and asbestos issues. Um, so the proposal is effectively, as you'll see from the existing proposal, is to replace like for like. Um, it currently has a stairwell and some storage at the at basement level. So, um, in terms of what you're going to see visually, it's going to be the, the exact same, only with uh, more modern materials. Um, again, this is the, the floor plan, so it's this very small area to the rear of the property. It's a, so, in terms of policy context, it's a, it's quite a minor application. The same policy context would apply as the previous application in terms of uh, BH8 and BH11 in terms of extension to a listed building. This is as a listed building. Um, we have consulted HED uh, and they're content that, uh, that, that, that this is okay subject to conditions. These are remedial works necessary due, due to the structure being unstable. Uh, again, there's the reasoning being for the removal of render and asbestos. So these are just necessary works that we um, that require permission unless the following consent and we have to put before you because they're within the Eppington complex. So in summary, our recommendation is that, that we that the, the application, the full application and the listed application are uh, approved and they'll have no adverse impact uh, and they're compliant with policy. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank, thank you, Maggie, and my apologies for the, the confusion at the start. Um, members, as Maggie's outlined, um, it, it's it, it's, a, it's a relatively um, small, minor application, but um, just the nature of it, it's required to become in front of this committee. Alderman McClintock? It's not a question, but as you said, it's, it's a minor alteration. I'm happy to propose if that's in order that we accept the officer's recommendation, both on item six and item seven. It is good to see, even if it is small changes, it is good to see things happening in the Everton site. So uh, very happy to propose the um, the two applications. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, um, thank you, Alderman McClintock, and I know that um, Councillor Money has has indicated he's on the second vote. Um, but before I go to a vote, I'm going to take them separately. Um, so first, um, the proposal from Alderman McClintock to accept the officer's recommendation on the full application, item six, um, which is seconded by Councillor Money. Is there any objections to that? No, I can take that as unanimous. And then in item seven, the list of building consent, um, again, proposed by Alderman McClintock, seconded by Councillor Mooney. Is there any opposition to that? No. Um, so those both applications have been approved and that concludes the applications for today's meeting. Um, Moving on now, um, on a relevant item that's been referred to already, it's a DFA notice of opinion in relation to Building 40 in Everton Square, and I'm going to hand over to Suzanne. Thanks, Chair. Um, members, so um, item nine's in your packs, and basically, obviously, we have we have received communication from the department in the form of their proposed notice of opinion um, on their intentions to approve the reserve matters. LA 11 2018 for the works at Building 40. Um, we have outlined today the details of the list of building consent, and those are aligned with the reserve matters as well. Um, and the department are seeking council's consideration if there's a requirement um, to seek a PAC hearing in respect of this case, given it's, it's been dealt with by the department. So, in line with the paper, um, officers are advising members that there's no issue uh, with the proposal. I mean, there's nine conditions being proposed, 28 informatives. Everything seems to be very well covered 
Um, and as a council, we're very well aware as well of what's happening. So um, we would have no cons no issues um, and no recommendation to seek a PA here, PAC here in respect to this case. Happy to take your views. Okay, um, and I suspect that the committee will concur, but again, not running the danger of assuming anything. Um, and so members, I'm here, keen to hear your view. Um, our members content with the chair. Yeah. So it's down here. Councillor Kelly, go ahead. Thanks. Yeah, you're you're, you're correct, uh, and not to assume. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm only joking. Uh, I I don't have an issue with the the notice. Uh, I, I'm just curious to know why the department uh, undertook to determine this reserve matters application. Um, I don't see anything in there. I was just wondering why. We didn't hear it at council why it was the department that undertook to hear uh, and determine this application. Um, through the chair, Councillor Kelly, um, the department will determine the reserve matters for cases that are regionally significant. So um, they originally, I think, determined the the outline. Um, maybe Maura, you want to come in and clarify that um, if there's any issue with that. But they will deal with any reserve matters on the site. Yeah, what it was, Councillor Kelly, um, in the past before transfer, we would have had ab applications. Um, there was an old style of um, sort of, they weren't necessarily major applications, but they were, um, I'm trying to remember the terminology for it, but Fort George and Everington were both being dealt with here locally as outlines. And just before transfer, both of those applications were removed and taken in by the department. Um, so we didn't issue them here as, as an advanced transfer. So therefore, DFI took those on, and that meant that the reserve subsequent reserve matters following that on both of those sites are potentially always DFI planning applications. So hopefully that clarifies that for you. Great, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, is there Alderman McClintock? Do you wish to come on on this one or? Um, is your name the chair? Just um, and I thank Councillor Kelly for his question there because I was wondering exactly the same thing myself. And thanks to Maureen and Suzanne for the clarification. No, I'm happy with um, the reassurances given by Suzanne on this that there are no particular issues and that there's nothing, no no point in um, looking for the the packed hearing on this. So happy to go with the officer's recommendation just to go ahead with this. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Kelly and uh, Councillor McClint or Alderman McClintock's proposal. Okay, thank you. Um, there's nobody else indicated to speak. And if there's, is there any opposition to that? Yeah. Um, I'm going to take that as unanimous. Um, members, items ten, eleven, and twelve are open for information. I know I want to bring Suzanne in on item 11, but before that, I'm going to, is there anybody wishes to raise anything out in the item 10, the plan and appeals update? No. I'm going to move on to item 11, the enforcement action update. Okay. I'm going to bring Suzanne in. Thanks, Chair. Um, members, this was really just a short paper to update you on the outcome of, of court action on two cases that you'll be familiar with um, that were previously um, put through your cells to, for proceeding to summons to court. Um, the first case was the unauthorised infilling and raising of land uh, with waste material, 10 to 20 mill path, Eglinton. And then the second one was unauthorised works to the list of building of 15 Northern Road. So both those cases have been to court and fines have been ordered to be paid on those, just as outlined in your paper. Um, so it's really just to keep you updated on the outcome of that court action as, as, it, as it goes through the system. Okay, thank you, Suzanne. And, and as I've said, this is um, for open for information. So there's no there's no decision um, to be taken by the committee. But um, if there's... Does anybody get any views? Is any questions? Um, for Suzanne in respect to the report that's in front of us. Can I have a brief question? 
Yeah, Councillor Kelly, go ahead. Yeah, where does the the money from the fines go? It, it comes in the, through the chair. It comes into council, as far as I'm aware, Councillor Kelly. Maybe Philip, you can advise further on that. No, I, I don't think so. Actually, Suzanne, um, okay. the the uh, fines go to the court, and the legal costs come to us, and um, the um, the court costs come to us as well because they're costs we've already expended in, in issuing the summons um, in respect of those matters. So um, we have had um, discussions with the magistrate in the past about increasing the level of costs um, that we can um, apply for uh, in these cases um, in order to try and mean that some of the money comes to us. Uh, and if a matter is dealt with by way of a fixed penalty in advance, as, as can happen in, in certain cases, or if we can negotiate a, a, a settlement of a case in advance, as can happen in certain cases, then the money comes to us. But actually, as soon as it's gone to court, then really the money's gone to us and it becomes a, an expense to council, unfortunately. Okay. Um, and I know there's quite a few in the, in the chat box that had similar queries. Is there anybody getting a further question? Do you want me to ask one? Yeah, Councillor Gellar. Just on, on, on the, uh, the legal opinion, it wouldn't be, Bob, you wouldn't be suggesting to the court some fancy accounting, would you? <laughs> By any chance? I, I, I was only a good point, sir. Okay, um, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to expect Philip to answer that. Um, is there any other question? No. Here. Councillor McGuire. Here is a general question, but it, it may not be on that particular issue, but it's, it's, it's just a query about something I thought was coming back to committee a long time ago. It was about the quarry restoration or so-called quarry restoration project. Uh, and the edge care sister ban. I was just wondering maybe sometime someone could give me an update on that. Okay, we can we can ask for a report to be brought back to that the the nearest committee. And if unless anybody's in a position to give her an update now. Um, Maura. Chair, sure, we'll have to look in and get an update um, and get that back in to um, Councillor McGuire, no problem. Um, there's a number of quarries clearly in the vicinity, so maybe if Councillor McGuire could just un maybe drop me an email and just make sure that I I'm responding on the exact one that he's interested in. Thanks. Okay. Um, are you content, Councillor McGuire? Yeah, I'm assuming so. Um, is there right? Well, so yeah, it was it was the one where it was uh, put in front of us as a restoration project, but it was clearly a, a landfall. Uh, in my opinion, it was taken away, but it never came back. And I was just wondering where it was, but uh, I think it was it was just in the outskirts of Sturban Town. Okay, well, um, I'll, I'll ask more just to liaise. We just to double check that we're because I, I can recall the, the application that you're talking about. Um, but it's just, um, I'll ask more just to get in touch with you and um, double check that we're the, the, the report is brought back in respect to the same the, the right application. Um, if there's no further comments or questions in respect to the enforcement action update, um, Going to ask, is there any questions? I know this is a list of decisions issued. Derek, can I just come back on the enforcement element of it? I, I think it, it's yeah partially partially related. It was it was a query I wanted to make because I, I think you'll know and I will all know that there's been much discussion, obviously, of of businesses coming out of coming out of lockdown and trying to operate. And I'm I'm kind of looking um, for. A view and opinion, not necessarily today, but I think it's something that we all should be concerned about. And that's, uh, I, I couldn't find anywhere that I could mention it, but I think it's important today if, you, if you'll bear with me briefly, um, Chair, because some bars, restaurants, etc., um, 
are not currently able to use outside areas because they're unlicensed. Uh, and amendments to licensed areas need to go to court and planning permission as a prerequisite for that, as I understand it. So one for the city solicitor, um, and I'm, he may well not have a, 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 an answer to it, but is there any way that these kinds of applications could be expedited? Because we we do have businesses and uh, across the city and district who are uh, who have struggled for uh, umpteen months, as we all know, and I'm sure they're very keen to get open and they're very keen um, to get. Uh, I mean, we, we saw an application recently where we uh, we allowed for a uh, a lean to if we'll put, for want of a better way. So I think I hope I explain myself as best I can with it, Chair. Yeah, no, you, you touched on it, and I, I, my understanding is that only our application came before the committee because it was a member of council. Um, but there's there's quite a lot of no, those applications. I think I think it was. Yeah, chair, I think that one, the one I'm talking about was over at Ebrington. Okay, um, I'm going to bring more on so you can provide the clarity. Hopefully, yes. you provide the clarity. Thank you, chair. Thank you, councillor Boyle. I think what I would like to update you on is there's been a lot of work going on behind the scenes with our staff liaising with um, the EHD team and various business teams across the council. Um, essentially, you know, there is a link up. Um, if we've got any applications in for Pavement Cafe, you know, changes and restorations in regard to sort of some of these business um, business case applications, um, we have been liaisoning and letting the agents and applicants know whether, for instance, some of these actually need permission at all. And um, because there are a um, majority of cases may fall into what would be considered permitted development or permitted development under the roads order. So we've been working through those cases on a, a you know, on as, as if and when they are appearing. And if they need planning permission, clearly we would obviously seek an application. Um, you know, the, the application for Ebrington only came in to the committee because all applications for Ebrington come into the committee. Um, so it's probably more unusual than what was normal. So at this point, Suzanne and Malachi have been working hard at keeping a, a list and a database of all those cases. And we're obviously giving advice to different parts of the council on that. Um, so that was just to give you an idea that it's this work has been ongoing and um, also any other kind of COVID recovery adjustments in terms of public realm as well. We've been working closely with our own team in terms of the regeneration team. So and giving them the similar advice. Um, so hopefully that chair, helps. But... Back, just, uh, supplementary to that chair, if you don't mind. No more, you see, the thing I'm more referencing is as the. That licensed premises, bars and restaurants specifically. Um, and or uh, the outside areas are not potentially sometimes licensed for the sale of alcohol. Um, and in order for them to go to court to get that area licensed, they need planning permission. So I suppose it's a bit chicken and egg, but you can't get the the license through the court if the planning permission is not there. And that, that's the element that I'm saying perhaps we need to consider expediting or I don't know, prioritizing to get they allow those sorts of businesses to get opened up um, um, more quickly than perhaps uh, they might otherwise be. And that, that, as I said, the reason I mentioned licensing and, that, and the city solicitor will know licensing probably better than any other rest of us. Uh, Chair, very briefly, because um, I appreciate this is sort of, you know, on the periphery of, of, of the, the work for this committee, but unless there's structural alterations required, um, there shouldn't be any requirement for any further or additional planning permission um, in respect of the licensing of outdoor areas. Um, and I think um, the, the, where the overlap is going to occur is exactly in the kind of um, areas that Maura is uh, describing there, where they're looking at um, <clears throat> because of the inclement uh, weather. Uh, that we get around here where structures are required um, to be erected, which may or may not be uh, PD um, and, and the team are obviously looking at those to see whether or not there's there's anything that can be done in respect of that. In terms of the requirement for planning permission, Councillor Boyle, that would require where it is needed, it would require a change in legislation for anything to be done in relation to that. And hopefully we will be 
above and beyond uh, this COVID crisis long before any such um, legislation would be introduced. And just the final point on that, um, Councillor Boyle, like, and, and this really is outside of the remit of planning, um, there have been, I know, issues um, in relation to exactly the nature of outdoor structures um, that are, are permitted. Uh, under the current regulations and and that the clarification at the present time with the legislation is that it's 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 the same kind of of structure that would be permitted under the smoking um, shelter regime. So hopefully that deals with with a few of those issues. Grand job, thank you, Christopher. Okay, thank you, and I, and I suppose we've got the assurance that that all officers, all planning officers, and the relevant council officers are working together on the issue and. And hopefully that in itself will expedite any issues that are, that may um, be arising for local businesses. But I'm going to move on now in terms of the list of decisions issued. Um, are members happy to take the losers there? Is there any questions in respect to them? No. Um, I'm going to need a proposer to go on the confidential. Chair. Opposed, Chair. Opposed. Councillor Money. Councillor Kelly. Myself, uh, yeah. Uh, it doesn't matter who you take. Councillor Boy. Right. Um, no, uh, could I get notification whenever we're on confidential?